Evening, everybody. Um, we have four public meetings tonight. So there are actually four forms in the back. Uh, if you want to uh, be recognized and have status, should there be a, an appeal, you should make sure your name's there. Uh, there you will have an opportunity to speak. Uh, and if you just say your name and address, uh, the chair will, uh, the chair, I'm the chair. The <laughs> We've had two really long nights, so. Uh, the clerk will kindly take your information down. So, thank you. Uh, so I will call the public meetings to or order. Uh, the notice of collection, personal information collected as a result of this public hearing and on the forms provided at the back of the room is collected under the authority of the P Planning Act and will be used to assist in making a decision on this matter. All names, addresses, opinions, and comments may be collected and may form part of the minutes, which will be available to the public. Questions regarding this collection should be forwarded to the Director of Planning and Development. The purpose of public meetings is to present planning applications in a public forum as required by the Planning Act. Following presentations, by the applicant, committee members will be afforded an opportunity to ask questions for clarification or further information. The meeting will then be open to the public for comments and questions. Interested persons are requested to give their name and address for recording in the minutes. There is also a sign-in sheet for interested members of the public at the back of the room. No decisions are made at public meetings concerning applications unless otherwise noted. The public meeting is held to gather public opinion. An exception to this rule is combined reports, which consolidates the public meeting and comprehensive reports. These applications are deemed by staff as straightforward and routine. The business practice has been in place for a number of years and is received by the applicants as efficient customer service and effective use of committee time. Please note that staff use discretion at determining if an application can be a combined public meeting comprehensive report to expedite the approval process. Public meeting reports are provided to inform the public of all relevant information Information gathered is then referred back to planning and development staff for the preparation of a comprehensive report and recommendation to planning committee. This means that after the meeting tonight, staff will be considering the comments made by the public in their further review of the applications. When this review is completed, a report will be prepared making a recommendation for action to this committee. The recommendation is typically to approve with conditions or to deny. These, this committee then makes a recommendation on the application to City Council. City Council has the final say on the applications from the City's perspective. Following Council decision, notice will be circulated in accordance with the Planning Act. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the local planning appeal tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. So we will begin uh, the meeting with, if I can find my right page here. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so the first public meeting tonight uh, has to deal with the draft plan of condominium uh, which is uh, 
for 327, 333, and 339 Select Drive. So the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Tao. I'm a planner with IBI Group. Um, so as uh, the chair indicated, this is a statutory public meeting for applications for zoning bylaw amendment, draft plan of condominium, and draft plan of subdivision. And the proposal is for a 51 unit townhouse development uh, on the west end of Kingston. So the subject property, uh, for those of you familiar, is located behind the Farm Boy grocery store on the eastern end of a select drive. There are um, some commercial, existing commercial uses on select drive uh, to the east, and there's a motel to the west, or sorry, to the to the east here, and then some commercial, including a self-storage use to the west. The subject property is comprised of three different lots. Um, Select Drive and the lots there on were developed initially about 30 years ago, um, cleared, land made available, the lots. These three lots in particular have never been developed. Um, there's, although it's designated commercial, there's policies in the official plan that allow for outmoded or underutilized commercial lands to be used for residential. So that's the, essentially the, the background for the availability of these lots for residential use. So there is an existing residential subdivision uh, to the south. This is, is known as a self-storage uh, use, single story, self-storage use to the west, farm by grocery store here, commercial plaza to the north. Uh, so these are the subject lands as they are today. Um, and this is uh, the view from Princess Street back in towards Select Drive, the grocery store, et cetera. So the proposal, as it says, for 51 unit residential subdivision uh, with freehold townhouse dwellings. Um, they're both standard townhouses as well as back-to-back -to -back townhouses in the middle of the block, which I'll show you in a few minutes. The proposal is for it to be a private road subdivision, so be a condominium road this allows for a narrower right-of-way, which allows you to uh, fit more um, units on the lot and allow actually for a, two, like a looped road. If this were a full 20-meter right-of-way, you wouldn't be able to achieve, you wouldn't have a looped road. You'd be left with a cul-de-sac, essentially. So the private road and condominium development allows for uh, the ability to loop the road and create the additional frontage. I'll just quickly take you through the layout uh, around the edge, there are townhouses, townhouse blocks, typically six unit blocks, um, except for some larger four unit blocks. On the southern edge, this is abutting the residential neighborhood here, uh, a private parquette located in this corner. And then in the middle block, these are back to back townhouses, so five um, on each side, fronting onto the streets, five here, five here. So back to back stack townhouses are not. Um, that common, um, though they're becoming more uh, common because they allow you to achieve greater density while still providing ground-oriented form of development. So you can have a garage, you can have a, your own front door and everything else, but the density is similar to what you get from a walk-up apartment or something of that nature. These are the facades of the buildings. Uh, so they're oriented. So this is the orientation towards Select Drive. The intention is to have the end units opening out the front doors onto select drive so that it is a street presence onto the public road. And then individual doors entering onto the private road within the site. The other facades, different designs are being contemplated. These are just conceptual at this point, but this is the, the iteration that the developer is using at this point. With respect to the policy context, it's supported in terms of providing intensification in a serviced urban area, existing roads, existing services uh, on the site, and allows for use of those services where they've been available for a number of years and, and haven't been uh, used for commercial purposes. Um, it provides also for a transition between lower rise subdivisions to the south and then the commercial on Select Drive and Princess Street. It's compatible with the adjoining uses and provides for that transition. With respect to the official plan, it says designate arterial commercial uh, along with the, the rest of the strip on this side of Princess Street. Um, so the official plan allows for that residential use in underutilized uh, commercial sites. 
requires, if there is residential, as to medium or high density, so 37.5 dwelling units per hectare uh, on up. So we're slotting in at 48 dwelling units, so we achieve that medium density threshold. Um, as I said, it, it pro provides for some transition to the residential uses to the south. It provides an eddy area uh, within the site to the private parquette. Uh, and there's also uh, pedestrian linkages to uh, parks nearby and also to obviously amenities such as farm boy grocery store, good life coffee shops, um, as well as active uh, Kingston Transit routes and express routes on Princess Street. There are a number of policy tests that apply in the OP, compatibility, um, residential use, commercial use policies, urban design. Um, we've gone through that as part of our planning report and identify that we are of the opinion that it satisfies those policies of the official plan. With respect to the zoning bylaw, it's also zoned commercial as you would expect. And so the proposal is to rezone it to a site-specific R4 residential zone. Um, R4 is as close to a townhouse stacked or back-to-back -back townhouse zone as you, there is in the existing zoning bylaw. Um, because it doesn't contemplate any of the zones of back-to-back -back townhouse style, uh, we are asking for some amendments to address that building form, including lot area, lot coverage, uh, landscaped open space for individual lots, particularly the interior back-to-back -back townhouse lots. Uh, minimum yards, and that ties into, to some extent, the private road design versus the public road design. Uh, uncovered surface parking, so allowing for additional parking uh, for the townhouse units uh, in, either the, in the front yard, essentially. Uh, and as well as building height, increasing from 10.7 uh, to 12.5 for the three stories. So with respect to the draft plan of subdivision, we're proposing eight residential blocks, uh, as you saw in the initial concept plan, and then a block for the private road and visitor parking, and then a, bar a block for the private parquette. Uh, there's also opportunity for a potential connection to the neighborhood to the south, if that's ever uh, proposed in the future. Part of the reason why the parquette was located here is because there is an easement uh, for city services, stormwater, um, at this point as well. So if there's ever an opportunity for the city to provide that connection, the parquet will enable that to happen. So with respect to the subdivision, the lots will be freehold as in a standard subdivision, but there'll be parcels of tied land to the condominium road. So that means that though you own a lot in the subdivision, your lot is legally tied or bound to the condominium so that each of the residents will be responsible and part of the condominium corporation and be responsible to maintain the private road, maintain services, maintain the park, visitor parking, et cetera. And that's, again, what the condominium would do uh, as well in terms of uh, having a condominium corporation that all the owners would be part of uh, as owners of lots that are tied to, to the condominium corporation. So in conclusion, we believe the policies of the Provincial policy statement are satisfied, the application conforms to the official plan, and that the application as proposed is appropriate and constitutes good land use planning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and the uh, planner working on this file? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, public notices were provided in accordance with the, uh, with the Planning Act. A total of 94 property owners within 120 meters of the subject property um, were sent mailed out notices. Um, in addition, there were uh, large format signs posted on the property as well as a courtesy uh, notice posted in the, uh, in the newspaper. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go to the committee. Are there any questions or comments from committee members? Seeing none, I'll Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It may be too question, but on the back-to-back -to -back townhouse model, will it be concrete brick in between those properties? Um, just through you. So between like the back walls of the, um, it's intended to be wood frame construction. So whatever's required by the building code in terms of uh, separation between the units. So um, I'm not sure if there's a. I believe it would just be wood frame and then uh, minimum layers of drywall um, for fireproofing between the two units. 
So but I'm not sure exactly what the, what the developer would intend to do above and beyond the building code in that respect. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Um, of uh, private road and it being narrow, does that impact uh, garbage collection or other any municipal ramifications from having that narrow entrance? Yes. Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> the private road still has to provide a fire route in terms of access uh, for fire trucks. So there are comments through the circulation process where Public Works is looking at uh, access for uh, garbage trucks as well. So that is something that is considered as part of it. Um, there's also the option for private collection. At this point, my understanding is that public collection would be pursued and we'd have to make sure that the private road would allow for that type of movement. Uh, private roads are not that common in Kingston, but just uh, the actual pavement width of a private road doesn't necessarily have to be a whole lot narrower than the pavement width of a local street of a public road. It's just the fact that the right of way from kind of street property line to property line is typically narrower, um, which forces you to put all your services a little tighter than usually municipalities would. Um, so it's still, the paved portion of the road is still at least seven meters wide. Um, so you know, three and a half meter driving miles in either direction and a fire route typically has to be at least six meters wide so it will provide for that type of access if needed. Thank you. Great. Yeah. So you, Mr. Chair, um, can you bring up the picture where you show uh, parking that would for visitors? Let's see. Probably this one, yeah. Uh, so there's five spaces over here including one barrier free space, and then there's three parallel spaces here. Will there be electric charging stations installed in this little area? Not at this time that I'm aware of. Um, it's probably something that could be equipped after the fact if there's demand. As a condominium uh, corporation, they would be in charge of um, deciding whether or not they wanted to install that type of service in the future, so that's, uh, it's possible it's there. The services would be in the road if needed. So. And uh, through the process, when is it anticipated this would start the construction process? I'm just curious. Um, as part of a and subdivision process, we have to get draft plan approval first, and then you usually have to do some more detailed design um, and some studies, depending on the, the depth of um, design required. Um, so ideally, construction would start at least on the preliminary in-ground works uh, later this year. So. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Hutchins. Are you expecting people to be able to in the street? Um, through you, Mr. Chair. No, the intention is because it's really wide enough for two-way traffic, there wouldn't be any on-street parking which is part of the reason why, A, we have visitor parking specifically, and B, also why there are um, wide driveway allowances, I guess, so there's an extensive amount of, of driveway, and that's, we've had some discussions with staff about the benefits of um, cons and pros and cons, I guess, of having uh, more parking in the front yards of units versus having um, off-site parking areas versus allowing on-street parking. Um, so we may see in a future um, iteration, we may see some reduction of some of the double uh, parking, uh, double driveways in some of the units to allow for some more landscaping. But um, in townhouse developments, even in public roads, if you, you know, anybody who's driven around in the evenings in a townhouse, a street typified by townhouse development, you see a lot of on-street parking, sometimes cars that straddle the sidewalk or extend out onto the road. So we're trying to proactively address um, those types of situations that may arise by not providing enough private parking, um, particularly with a private road where there isn't on-street parking. Um, and just making sure, obviously, we don't get people, you know, filling up the cul-de-sac with cars because they don't have enough room to park within the site. So we're trying to balance provision of enough parking without um, creating a streetscape that's dominated by driveways. So, so are you... Uh, um, it appears you're planning, what, two cars per, per house in the um, front yards there? 
Yeah, that's two units here. The, each unit has uh, at least one garage. Some of the units would have a double garage. Um, let me just go back to the, there. Um, so some units, so an N unit, for example, uh, in this model, in this block, this N unit would actually have a double garage um, for, for parking, and then all the other units in this block would have a single garage and either a single driveway or a double driveway. Again, going back to the experience on the ground of townhouse developments where a lot of people put other things than cars in their, dry, in their garages and use it for storage, um, the intention is to try to provide enough parking um, so that people can park in their driveway with two cars and use their garage likely for storage or that type of thing. Um, the anticipated market for this is going to be first-time home buyers, couples, singles, maybe retirees, um, which the developer feels likely uh, most of them will have two cars, so trying to, again, try to proactively provide for that, uh, given that there's not a lot of room for parking anywhere else. So, so it's 51 units, right? 50. And eight visitor parking spots. Yeah. So one for every six and a bit. Yeah. There's no visitor parking requirements in zoning bylaws, and it's contemplating that as part of the new zoning bylaw, whether or not they want to mandate visitor parking minimums for different types of residential. Um, so we are providing visitor parking, we're over providing parking um, for, by the bylaw minimums anyway for the, each of the individual units. Um, so it's you know, you're trying to predict uptake and see if that will hopefully match the demand. Thank you. And I have just a question, so if the vice chair can I take the chair and recognize team. you. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate Councillor Chappelle's question regarding uh, the availability of a charging. Um, I'm not, I'm sure you're aware our new official, although it doesn't mandate it, it strongly recommends uh, facilitating uh, a charge charging capability because if you put it in at time of construction i think it's like a, the equivalent of a uh of wiring for a stove and it costs about 80 85 dollars if you <laughs> wait and try the owner has to retrofit it later it's hundreds of dollars so if you could share that with the developer um i think it would be, and since you have garages, it would be a natural to uh, to have that option built in at the time of construction. Yeah. So, and the other question I'm going to start asking more frequently as a result of the public meeting we had, or the meeting, uh, special council meeting we had, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of approvals. Uh, for and sometimes it's years before they come on stream. Um, is the intention of this developer, are you aware, is the intention to build it over the next couple of building seasons? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, the intention is to, to build as soon as possible. He's been very clear about wanting to, to keep the project rolling so um, and this type of building form is is relatively easy to move quickly or to construct quickly um, so yeah the intention is to move quickly with it yeah. thank you very much I yield you the chair thank you we will now turn to the public if any member of the public wishes uh, to make comment or ask questions now would be your opportunity uh, there's microphones at both sides uh, so feel free to uh, grab a mic and ask whatever questions you might have. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Frank Dixon, 495 Alpha, Department 2, K7K4, J4. Um, thank you to Mr. Tao for the presentation and the report, and thanks to the counselors for questions so far. So I'm not going to repeat the questions that have already been asked, but um, I think it's an excellent infill project. Um, it's in an area that's already fairly well developed, so it's close to arterial shopping, uh, transit routes, that's great. I'm supporting the zoning change needed. Um, I think the design is attractive and it's making very good use of the space, very efficient. 
So uh, the points I've got is our... Um, just carrying on a little bit from one of the questions already asked, um, in terms of, say, uh, snow maintenance, right? We're in the middle of winter. Um, is this going to be a city-maintained area for snow uh, removal and that sort of thing, or like putting up snow banks or taking it away? I think that's an important uh, issue. And then going along with that, I think the land is fairly flat up there. I've been up in that area a number of times, and you're building on an area that maybe has some metal or whatever. So in terms of stormwater management, right, where's the water going to go when it lands on the property from rain? Um, another point is on the parking side, um, are you going to have any uh, parking for uh, visitor bicycles? Maybe just a couple of posts that you could install where people could lock their bikes safely while they're visiting. Fairly small thing. Um, and I guess my next point is uh, Talk about 51 units, but what's the total number of bedrooms involved? Has that been itemized? I didn't actually see that in the report. It might be good to know that. Um, just some sort of terms to estimate how many people could actually live there. Um, is it 50 or 75 or 100, right? So just so we know that because as Councillor Neal was saying, there was a comprehensive presentation last night from city staff on the sort of big picture parking uh, planning issues the city is facing. So um, I think that's all my points. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Are there, uh, usually we collect all the comments and questions and at the end the uh, planner or our staff can address them. So uh, are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none. Uh, I'll ask one more time. No further questions or comments. I'll declare this public meeting over. Uh, and we'll move on to the next one, which I believe is 189 Montreal Street. Oh, right you are. The eight. You're letting me off easy? I, I'm not going to. Okay. I've been corrected. All right. Um, so through you, Mr. Chair, thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dixon. Um, so four questions, snow maintenance, um, there, so there is a stormwater report that's being done and grading plans that ties into your stormwater question as well. That's also considered as part of the snow maintenance. Um, so for the most part, snow will be removed in fairly short order after snowfall because it is a narrower, it's a private road, narrower cross section. There's not as much of a boulevard to pile snow after snowfall. So from modest snowfall then, it would probably stay on site, um, but for the most part, it would be removed um, as part, of the, as part of the maintenance of the private road. Stormwater management, again, there's a stormwater study being done as part of any typical subdivision. Um, so there will be grading um, done to ensure proper drainage. And then the private parquette uh, may be used for storage, whether it's a storm scepter um, or some other method of retention on site. Um, so we do have to make sure that pre-development runoff is maintained after development. Bicycle parking, um, there's no requirement for bicycle parking for this type of ground-oriented development. Um, typically, just you know, within the garages, um, but in terms of maybe bicycle parking in the parquette, um, that's something that we can, or the visitor parking area, that's something that they can make note of and um, see if that's something that would be integrated into the landscape plan um, and then, or the site plan. And bedrooms, uh, it's a mix of one and two bedroom units. Uh, I don't believe there are any three bedrooms in, the, in it because it's all towns, so um, mostly ones and twos. I don't know the exact mix. So. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick comment. Uh, site plan is where uh, the decisions are made regarding snow removal and waste management and uh, parking. And... Uh, although that's not a zoning concern, we stretch the rules a little bit and allow people to, to comment on that since this is the, often the only public meeting. And we do have comment. Through you, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to confirm that it is something that we would review during the draft plan of subdivision uh, application to ensure that the functional needs of that uh, actual parcel of land are met. So it is something that we would consider through this process. Thank you very much.
So now we will move on to 189 Montreal Street. Uh, so if the proponent's planner could. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, thank you and good evening. My name is Jennifer Wood. I'm a land use planner with Foten Consultants, and I'm here this evening to present a proposed zoning bylaw amendment for 189 Montreal Street on behalf of the owner and applicant. So this property is located on the east side of Montreal Street uh, between Miller's Lane and Raglan Road. It currently contains a two-story single detached dwelling um, as you can see in the, the lower left-hand side photo, um, it's, it's quite a large lot. It's 710 square meters in size and has 18 meters of frontage. And when you look at it in comparison to the surrounding lot fabric, you can see that it's, it's virtually a double lot uh, and is quite deep as well. Um, so the owner, uh, in consultation with, with myself, kind of identified an opportunity here for some residential infill development. Just looking uh, a little bit more zoomed out at, at the surrounding and neighborhood context, this property is located within the Inner Harbor neighborhood. Uh, it's quite centrally located in proximity to the downtown core. The surrounding area is predominantly residential, although there are some commercial and mixed use developments along Montreal Street, as well as a number of parks and community facilities within the 400 meter walking distance, which at that radius you can see circled around the property on, on this slide. Uh, typical building heights range, most are, are one to two and a half stories, um, some three story as well. And being located on Montreal Street, this property does have uh, good access to public transit and it is, is quite walkable as well. This is the property as it exists today, minus all of the snow and ice, but I think this gives a bit better of a sense of, of what we have there today. Uh, so it is a two-story detached dwelling. It's today virtually right on that south property line, um, leaving the balance of the site to the north open for parking, uh, and, and there is an existing small garage on the left-hand side. And you can't really tell from, from this image, but it is quite a deep lot. Just doing a little bit of a tour now for some context. This is immediately to the north, next door. Um, a more modern infill. It's a semi-detached uh, with uh, attached garages that are somewhat below grade. Um, and then beyond that, the more typical of what we see on the stretch of Montreal Street, which is a two-story detached dwelling. Immediately across the street to the west, uh, on the other side of Montreal, we, we mostly see two-story and, and two-and-a-half-story single detached dwellings right up to the lot line uh, with minimal side yard setbacks as well. And then looking uh, next door to the south, we have a detached dwelling next door and followed by that some, some brick semis and that gravel driveway is actually uh, between the gray dwelling and the brick semi is is actually Miller's Lane. So what we are proposing with this property is to remove the existing single detached dwelling, sever the property roughly down the middle, uh, creating a, a lot fabric more consistent with what's surrounding the property, and construct a new two and a half story dwelling on each of the parcels. Within each of the dwellings, we're proposing three residential units. So over the entire site, it would contain six units. Um, one thing we, we considered early on was how do we want to treat parking? Um, 
and when we, we look at the surrounding context with the exception of right next door to the north, which is uh, attached garages and the building is, is quite set back, which is reflective of what the zoning requires, which is a six meter front yard setback. When we look beyond that, we see the predominant form is either side or rear yard parking. Uh, attached to garages is, is just not what we see uh, historically in this neighborhood. Um, so it was decided pretty early on that we want to focus the parking in the back. Uh, so we're proposing a shared driveway right down the middle. So we will need reciprocal easements uh, to a parking area in the back. Each lot or each building will have three parking spaces, so one parking space per unit. We are including a barrier-free parking space on each. Amenity space is being provided both at grade uh, in the rear yard as landscaped open space. Um, it's not decided at this point whether the intent is to keep that as sort of grass to more natural space or if it will be uh, uh, patio stone um, as well. Amenity space is being proposed at, on the roof, which will be accessible to all units within the building. Now, this is a zoning bylaw amendment application, will, which will set the performance standards, so parking, setbacks, height. It's really the site plan process that will dictate the specifics of the design and the architecture. Um, but we did want to share at this point the intent for the site, uh, which is, as I said, a two and a half story dwelling. Um, the idea here is unlike what's, what's next door, that's, it's actually what we've been trying to avoid despite the fact that what's next door is much more in conformity with what the zoning requires than what we're proposing here. Uh, we wanted to match more of what's in the neighborhood, which is two to two and a half story, single detached dwellings, um, traditional gable lines. These elevations, especially the top right, um, are shown as if you're sort of two, three meters in the air across the street. From the street level and from the pedestrian level, uh, especially considering how far back that stair overrun is, and you can see that in the side elevation, uh, we really hope that that overrun will be uh, minimally visible, if at all, from uh, the streetscape. So really, from the street, what these will look like are two single detached dwellings that are longer and therefore can accommodate uh, three units inside. And you can also see in the side elevations uh, sort of the, the extent of the rooftop patios. Looking at the official plan, this property is designated residential. Uh, the residential designation permits various forms, tenures, and density of residential uses. Um, I took a quick peek at the uh, draft land use plan for the North Kingstown secondary plan, which is underway. Um, and at this point, this property is still slated to stay within the residential designation. Um, if we go slightly north of here, north of Raglan, uh, Montreal does transition into uh, Main Street commercial designation. So important to consider that the long-term vision is for this property to continue to be residential. And the, the OP speaks to uh, how we would like to see our, our existing stable neighborhoods uh, grow and develop and intensify over time. And within these areas, uh, stable areas, applications for infill are, are anticipated, uh, but must be located uh, and organized to fit within uh, neighboring properties, including cultural heritage resources, and must address a number of criteria, one of which being infill needs to be supported by adequate servicing. We have prepared a, a servicing study and stormwater management study, which indicates there is capacity to support this increased density. Um, we need to demonstrate suitability of the dwelling type, the lot size, the building height and massing, building materials, and exterior design. Again, from a built form perspective, we're really trying to achieve something similar to what's in the neighborhood, which is from the streetscape, have it look like a two and a half story single detached dwelling. Um, 
Compatibility is also a big consider consideration within the official plan. The OP, the provincial policy statement, really encourages intensification in our, in our downtowns, but that has to be met with considerations of compatibility. Um, and I'll speak to that a bit more in my next slide. Um, the OP goes on to say that in fully serviced areas, intensification through moderate increases in building height or density uh, and gradual transition to more intensive forms of housing may be considered at the edge of neighborhoods, adjacent to transit routes, and near community facilities, open spaces, and in close proximity of our uh, mixed-use centers and corridors. So, I mean, I can say this is compatible all day long, but what, what does that actually mean? Um, and the OP provides very specific criteria, uh, and in particular, lists potential adverse impacts that could result from proposed intensification on existing properties, nearby properties, existing neighborhoods. And there's a long list. Um, shadowing needs to be considered. At, at two and a half stories, we don't anticipate there being significant shadow impacts. Uh, loss of privacy due to intrusive overlook. Uh, as of 10 minutes before this meeting, I did receive correspondence from, from neighbors identifying concerns with potential intrusive overlook of the rooftop patio, um, which I can certainly speak to if there are folks here tonight who, who want to discuss those concerns. Um, increased levels of light, pollution, noise, odor, dust, or vibration. Um, we are proposing a rear parking lot. Parking lot, there's three parking spaces per per lot. We will be going through site plan control, which will look specifically at lighting and ensuring that it is all pointed towards the property and downward so as not to overflow onto uh, surrounding properties. Increased level of traffic as well. Uh, we're not in anticipating significant impacts on the traffic network from this level of intensification. Um, environmental damage and, and degradation. Um, Diminished service levels uh, on physical and, and social infrastructure. Again, this is a very central, the centrally located property in walking distance of many existing amenities and services, and we don't anticipate the six units overloading that system. Uh, reduction in the ability to enjoy a property or the normal amenity associated with it. Um, visual intrusion that disrupts the streetscape. Again, we're really trying to provide an infill that will fit in with what's already there, uh, and architectural compatibility. So rather than, and I hate to bash on the, on the neighboring property, but we really are trying to provide a built form that is more reflective of what's, what's nearby. Uh, traditional gabled roof, bring that building up to, up to the sidewalk and street level and reduce those setbacks. And we don't anticipate any impairment to uh, views or cultural heritage resources. So the property is currently zoned one and two family dwelling A, which permits one and two family dwellings and also supportive community uses. What we're proposing is a site specific three to six family B zone for each of the properties. And I'll discuss a little bit about what each lot would look like in terms of the reliefs that we're seeking. So again, next door, uh, the modern infill semi-detached with the attached garage, uh, which I would argue does not, is not consistent with the established built form of the neighborhood, likely has a six meter setback, which is what's required in this zoning bylaw. We wanna continue the predominant streetscape, bring the building up to uh, the sidewalk, Majority of homes here have a zero lot line setback from the front. Some of them even encroach into the, to the right of way. We're proposing a one meter setback to maintain that, that street wall, but also provide enough of a setback for, for stairs and an entry feature and to be able to actually access and maintain the front of the building without being in the right of way. Uh, similarly, we're proposing reduced side yard setback to one meter as well as aggregate side yard setback. We are proposing an increase in density uh, than what is uh, permitted in this zone from 69 dwelling units to 94 dwelling units per hectare. 
Uh, we're not seeking a reduction in the number of parking spaces. We are meeting the bylaw requirement, but we are proposing a reduction in the stall size to 2.6 meters by 5.2. For barrier-free parking, we're not touching the width of the stall, but we are proposing a reduced length uh, to match up with the length of the standard parking spaces. Uh, we're requesting uh, entrance features or steps to project beyond the front of the building so that we can have steps or an entrance feature. Um, and also, we are not seeking relief in the amount of amenity space per unit required. Um, but the bylaw does have a requirement that any communal amenity space must have a minimum area of 54 square meters. I think we're in the, air, in the realm of 40 uh, square meters. We're proposing four separate amenity spaces at grade and rooftop for both lots, uh, and we're not quite at that 54. So lot B, this is the bigger lot to the south. It's almost identical in the reliefs that we're seeking. Um, the two exceptions are it's a lower density simply because it's a bigger lot. Uh, so in this case, the density we're proposing is 77 dwelling units per hectare instead of 69. And we are seeking a little bit of relief on lot coverage. Uh, required is 33.3 and we're seeking 35. So we're over uh, about 2% there. Uh, so to conclude, it's, it's my opinion that this proposal represents good land use planning. It's consistent with the provincial policy statement. Uh, it's consistent with the general intent of the official plan. Uh, and it's a, a use and a built form that I feel are compatible with the context of the surrounding neighborhood. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Um, if the staff person in charge of this file could speak to it, that'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, public notices uh, were provided in accordance with the Planning Act for this uh, zoning bylaw amendment application. A uh, total of 149 property owners were notified um, through mailed uh, notices um, within a 120 meter radius of the uh, of the subject property there was also a courtesy uh, notice uh, placed uh, in the newspaper uh, signage was posted on the property as well um, to date uh, five pieces of public correspondence have been received um, and they have been provided as an addendum to the uh, agenda tonight for committee's consideration thank you thank you uh so I will turn to the committee if there are any questions or concerns uh, that committee members have. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, I would like to talk for a about amenity space. You mentioned if this is to be severed, this property is to be severed, there'll be uh, slightly less amenity space than required. I'd like to draw a contrast between the current amenity space with uh, the site as it is now and what is being proposed. And I'm wondering how much green space is on the current site? Okay, so I'm first just gonna pull up the zoning table, which is, and, the, and there are ultimately proposed to be two properties, so they are slightly different. So this is, this is lot A, this is the smaller lot. Um, and and I, do, I do wanna just clarify that we are meeting the minimum, minimum required amenity space per unit. So that requirement in this location is 18.5 square meters per unit. Is this on this slide? Uh, no, there it is at the bottom. So uh, 18.5 square meters times uh, three units is 55.5 square meters. We're, we're meeting or exceeding the minimum requirement on both properties. And that's being met uh, in, in two ways. We're proposing both at grade amenity space, um, so your, your traditional rear yard green space, um, and we're also pr proposing uh, rooftop amenity space for both units. Um, so that is being met. What we are seeking relief for is um, what the zoning bylaw says is that if you're gonna provide amenity space in a communal fashion, it needs to be provided in consolidated areas of no less than 54 square meters. And the intent of that is so we don't result in 
10 square meters here, 10 square meters there, and ultimately not a functional amenity space. So that's the intent of that provision. We are slightly below that minimum consolidated area, uh, but each individual amenity space area is in the mid 400 square foot range. So they are functional spaces. Um, and, and the idea too is to break up the amenity spaces so we don't have one big party zone per se, but we have a, a small amenity space at grade and a small rooftop terrace as well. Uh, in terms of what the existing landscaped open space is, I'd have to get back to you on that one. But what I can say is that we are meeting or exceeding the minimum requirement, which is 30% on both properties. Thank you. Councillor Hassan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, um, the aerial shot that you showed us, it looks like there are some trees on the property. So I just wondered what the tree loss will be like. Um, it does look like maybe there's a couple of trees behind the parking lot that might be able to be retained. But I just wondered um, what analysis has been done. It has. Uh, and through you, Mr. Chair, I'm just pulling the tree inventory. I think I can remember. Um, so a tree inventory was done by Arbor Care Arborists, uh, and they're, the majority of uh, canopy that you see uh, is actually trees on other properties or kind of right in the fence line. They identified two trees on this property. Uh, one is an apple tree, which is basically located uh, right in the middle of the proposed parking lot um, so it will have to be removed it does have some fire blight uh, which is a bacteria condition so it is in moderate to poor condition currently anyway there is a tree uh, a Manitoba maple I believe it is right at the rear of of lot a which is the deeper lot right close to the the fence line um, it is in poor condition, according to the arborist. There are a number of issues with it, but it's intended to be maintained. It doesn't have to be removed to support the development. Thank you. I did read some of the letters um, that were submitted with this that also mentioned Overlook. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if you could make any comment on that. Yeah, sure. So I'll bring up, I mean, this, is, this plan really shows it. The dark gray areas on the building footprints are the proposed rooftop amenity. And I, I know there were concerns too about that coupled with the height and whether there will be overlook. And, and I believe a lot of the comments came from those who back onto this property on Bagot Street. I guess the first thing I want to highlight is, is the significant rear yard setback. The minimum requirement is eight meters. Lot A has a setback of 18 meters and lot B is 21 meters. I believe a lot of the rear yards backing onto this have pretty substantial setbacks as well. Um, there could be instances where, where folks on the roof could, could overlook, um, but I think that we're far enough separated, we're, we're two to three times the rear yard setback, um, that we'll have pretty good separation. If you look uh, next door to the north, the, the semi that's really set back, um, that rooftop basically looks at its rooftop as opposed to their rear yard amenity, um, and I believe to the south, which is to the right on this plan. Um, it's predominantly, uh, that's actually a, a quite short lot uh, along the laneway. Um, so it's, it'd be overlooking a, a parking area on Miller's Lane. Um, what we can look at is perhaps providing um, a, a guardrail that's opaque as opposed to glass so that when, when folks are sitting up there, um, they can't, can't see over. Uh, we can certainly look into that or some kind of screening. You're welcome. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison. Mr. Chair, just a question about the, um, the zoning. The, um, the maximum density allowed under the A zoning is for family units, one or two units. And is that understood to be the um, density for an A zoning? Um, and then on the B, that's my first question. Okay. Um, maybe I should be asking staff about that. 
because it says not applicable under the staff description, but it seems to me it would be understood to be that. So um, then it says for B, it's 69 dwelling units, and your your uh, your applicant is suggesting 94. So would this first of all be defined as spot zoning, A to B? And then it's in excess of the B, correct? Uh, thank you, and, and through you, Mr. Chair. So you're testing my, my memory of other zones, uh, but I believe the A zone doesn't include an actual density requirement in terms of dwelling units per hectare as the B zone does. Um, it does permit up to two dwelling units. Um, we are proposing a B zone, which is a three to six family zone. That said, we are proposing three units, so one additional unit than what is permitted as of right in the A zone. Um, I recognize it does permit up to six units. Practically speaking, it's impossible uh, without additional process to go beyond three units because we couldn't fit an additional parking space. We wouldn't meet amenity. We wouldn't meet landscaped open space. So practically speaking, it would be impossible to go above three units on each lot without triggering more of a planning process. Uh, so while we are going to the B zone, we are one additional unit more than what's permitted in the A zone. That tells me what description is. It doesn't tell me the density, but I, I told you the density, so you don't need to comment on that. Um, it says right here in the staff report, 90, proposed 94 dwelling units per net hectare. Okay? That's correct. And uh, so 50% um, more approximately than allowed under the B zoning. Yes, that's correct half, for half lock. of 69 being 35 and added together, so 40%. Okay. Um, just on the accessible parking spaces, I noticed that in each case, you making them shorter than is required. Um, so I guess my concern is, is whether people who need accessible parking spaces often have small van, vans or small vans, and I'm just wondering if they actually fit, if it's 5.2 versus 6 meters. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Ch um, that's a good question. I'm not sure what the average length of an accessible van is relative to the proposed 5.2 meter length. Um, I can say that is, it has become standard practice to reduce barrier free stall length to that length. Um, we are somewhat restricted in terms of the width of the lot here, um, but we can see if we can, uh, I mean, I don't necessarily wanna bring the parking too close to the property line and we do need some of that green space for stormwater management purposes, but perhaps what we need to do is look at, look at shifting that to make them a little bit longer. Um, and I can certainly compare to and investigate the length of some of the larger barrier-free vans that in particular might require rear, yard, or rear loading uh, versus side. So uh, your, your point is well taken. So it would be fair to say that parking and amenity space are in some competitive relationship in this particular site? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, we are meeting the minimum required amenity space and parking. We are seeking relief in the dimensions of parking, yes. Okay. Thank you for now. Any further questions from the committee? If you could take the chair just very quickly. Yeah, uh, I'm on the... Um, the council representative on MAC, the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, I wanna thank Councilor for bringing up that question. I know that there are some private developments that routinely ask for a variance on 
uh, on uh, accessible parking. I will just say, for me, it could be the difference between on a comprehensive report between voting yes or no on a on a recommendation. I don't think. I think we should demand of the private sector what is demanded of the public sector, which is meeting ODA standards for accessible parking. So if there's any way that you can achieve that, that would be good. I see I've rattled the chain of one of our planners <laughs> who would like to comment on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would like to just make a point of clarification about our accessible parking standards. So right now in our existing zoning bylaws, the requirements from an accessible parking space actually go above and beyond what's required from an AODA perspective. So um, to my knowledge, the AODA doesn't actually include a length requirement. It only includes the width of the parking spaces plus the width of the accessible aisle. Um, so from the perspective of the applicant, requesting a reduction to the length of the parking space is actually still consistent with the AODA standards. It is something that is above and beyond in our zoning bylaw. I stand corrected. Thank you. <laughs> so. Uh, chair, are you? I'm sorry. Yes. You want the chair back? That's great. Thank you. Um, so open this up for public uh, comments and questions. And again, uh, microphones on both sides. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, my name is Andy Soper. I live at 202 Montreal Street, which is directly across the road from the property in question. Um, I just have a few observations, a couple of questions. Uh, I'm opposed to the application uh, initially because it involves a demolition, which I think is almost always unfortunate. This is probably the original building on that site. Uh, the outlines that we've seen this evening seem to suggest a, a degree of intensification verging on the crowding. Uh, there are some very difficult traffic issues. It's a narrow, very busy part of Montreal Street, a shared driveway with up to six vehicles trying to come and go is, I think, quite a challenge for the site. Uh, compatibility on the screen, we saw one provision, um, compatibility within the context of the surrounding neighborhood. I find it not to be so. I think it's seeking too much relief. Uh, all those elements of, of relief that were requested or outlined uh, appear to add up to a, a, a crowding, uh, uh, too much shaving of, of too many factors. There was a question about how much green space is associated with it. The, the lot as it stands at present uh, is more than half green. It's a very delightful garden. And anyone who passes by that way uh, enjoys the, uh, the scene of that garden. The... Um, Particulars of a of a of a, a tree, a maple or a, a fruit tree, what have you, are possibly neither here nor there. It's a it's a large green space right now, and the general public does witness that. And my final question is um, a, a detail on the um, applicant. The notice that came uh, from the city in the first place to the neighbourhood listed Fo Ten as the applicant. Uh, I'm a little bit mystified about what part they play um, uh, the, 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 by this evening. The name of the applicant has, in fact, um, changed. Uh, I did submit a letter. I just got it to the clerk before this meeting, and I would ask the members of the committee to um, try and catch up with that. I've outlined 
my ideas in, in writing there. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that uh, letter that you've submitted will be uh, received as official correspondence. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> my name is Mark Griffin. I live on 492 Bagot Street, so my backyard backs right on to 189 Montreal Street. Uh, I want to preface this with my family and I aren't against development on the site, but what I'd like to see is something a little more reasonable uh, for the site than what's currently being proposed. Um, one of my main concerns, I'll just go over maybe a couple of my main concerns, but one of my main concerns are the precedent that a change from an A to a B zone will set in our neighborhood. Uh, section 2.6 of the city's official plan is to maintain and improve the city's quality of life by having a pattern of cohesive neighborhoods and districts and managing the degree of change that is warranted in stable areas to use and achieve development and land use. Um, there are currently no B zones in the area. Uh, this helps to create and preserve a sense of community uh, for long-term owners and renters alike. Uh, there's a sense of community which initially drew me and my family to the area, and it's what's kept my wife and I in the downtown core uh, as our family has continued to grow. Um, the current proposed development is considered a high density for that land use, uh, and it's still unable to meet the more intense B zone standards uh, in terms of the density, setback, parking standards, and amenity area. Um, Another of my main concerns I have regarding the rooftop patio, obviously. Uh, there are no other rooftop patios in the area. Uh, it'll seem out of place in the neighborhood. Um, having this overlook will infringe upon the privacy of the residents of the building, my family's privacy, as well as my neighbors. Uh, personally, I believe it's an acceptable solution to have maybe a couple units uh, with one primary and one secondary unit in each building. Uh, so you can increase the capacity of the current development uh, by four times rather than six. Um, and I'm requesting that the planning, planning committee direct the applicant to redesign the project to reduce the total number of units and eliminate the rooftop patio space. Great. Thanks for your time. So I'll turn to this side. Is there anybody on this side that would like to speak to this file? Seeing none, I'll return to this side. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Michael. I am. Um, Perfect. Thank you. So, my name is Michael Pope. I own 496 Baggett Street, which also directly backs on to this proposed development. Uh, I have a variety of concerns, a lot of which have been already addressed, although, to be quite frank, not to my satisfaction. Firstly, the precedent that this is setting by changing to a B zone is quite dangerous for our neighborhood. Mark very eloquently explained that. I'm not going to expand on it, but that is a genuine concern from so many of the people in our neighborhood. The community aspect of that is critical, and it has not been adequately addressed. So obviously, I stand in staunch opposition to this proposed rezoning. I am, however, not opposed to development on this property. I understand that we want to intensify this area, but six units where there was one home is simply too big an ask. We, the, excuse me one second, I need to find my, find my note. So in terms of the provisions, under a zone B, this fails to meet eight of 16 and nine of 16 provisions for the A and B lot, respectively. They're not even making half of the provisions of a zone B, yet it's already zoned as zone A. Quite frankly, that's unacceptable. Finally, I have a unique perspective on this matter. So I work as a professional hydrologist for Queen's University. Increasing the impermeable percentage of land, as this proposes to do, may meet stormwater capacity for the municipality. It does not, however, mean that there will not be adverse effects to those properties immediately downslope. 
I am one of those such properties that is immediately downslope. I was able to do a preliminary hydrologic model in my spare time. On a normal Kingston rainfall event, it will increase the amount of precipitation runoff from their property onto mine by 50%. Larger rainfalls with higher intensities, such as thunderstorms and larger storms, can increase it by more than double. The soils in this area are clay. They are not susceptible to drainage through the soil itself. So a lot of the water comes off as surface runoff. As we can see, they're nibbling away at each and every corner. And compared to the green space that there is now, the buffering capacity for stormwater is just simply not going to be there. Earlier in the presentation, they even reference turning some of the current lawn space in this proposal into patio stone. That'll just exacerbate this problem to an extreme level, to be totally honest. And finally, the rooftop overlook, I, I mean, come on. You're looking directly into my yard, but not only my yard, my bathroom and one of my bedrooms. You can turn an opaque screen up. Yeah, that's a visual block. But it doesn't come to, it doesn't account for the auditory disturbance in privacy. If you have people chatting on an elevated surface, the sound simply carries further. If I want to have a conversation in my backyard, granted it is somewhat far away, there's no real obstruction between myself and that patio. To be honest, this proposal sounds like a great idea if, and only if, it was reduced in size. A two-unit dwelling on two two-unit dwellings on this lot abide by zoning A requirements. Everyone is happy. We get development. We get intensification. There's profit to be made. Making Going from one unit to six, it, it just... To be totally frank, it seems greedy. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks to the planner for the presentation and the report and the council uh, questions so far and the members of the community who have spoken up. I don't live right near there, but I did for a number of years within a few blocks. So I know the neighborhood quite well. Um, I'm supporting um, infill in general, but I do believe that this is too much additional building on the site. And I agree with a lot of the points that have been made by the neighbors. So my suggestion is that you do several things. Um, you retain the existing house that's there. As someone mentioned, it might be the original house, and this is a mature neighborhood. Uh, I believe there's houses back well into the 1800s there, and this leads into my next point. If it is the original house, why isn't there a heritage aspect of the report? I mean, it might not be listed or designated yet, but as we encountered at the last meeting, um, we may be dealing with a very interesting property here from a heritage standpoint. I don't know uh, what the details on that are, but I believe it needs examination before the project uh, carries on. So, um, I guess my next point is that um, there is a, an example not that far away from this particular property where infill development was carried on successfully with the original house being retained. And I refer specifically to the project on the northeast corner of Division and Pine Streets, which is about maybe six or seven blocks away. And on that corner was an 1840 house that was retained. And there's kind of an L-shaped um, new development which wrapped around it. And that was presented in November 2014, um, accepted, built, and has been successful. So this is a much smaller lot, 
But what I would suggest is that one or two new units be built on the property and not six and the original house be, re be retained. I think that's much better in terms of a density fit and a neighborhood uh, match. So thank you. Are there any further comments or questions? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Serena Olson. I also live on Baggett Street. Uh, my house and the backyard butts up right onto one of the properties that they're proposing to build on. Um, my issues have um, largely been talked about already, but I'd just like to reiterate them, um, mostly to do with the patio on the rooftop. I mean, it would look literally right into my bedroom. Um, there's only so much of walls they can put up on a rooftop patio um, that's going to obstruct their view um, before it's no longer a usable space for the people who actually inhabit it. Um, not to mention noise issues. I mean, if you can have potentially up to six people um, at that patio at one time, plus friends and acquaintances, et cetera, I mean, that can get very large. Um, she mentioned earlier that she didn't want it to turn into some kind of party patio or that the people who are developing this um, were concerned about that. Um, and it's very likely that that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, in a neighborhood like ours where it's, uh, you know, more young professionals and families and things like that, it's a lot less of a student neighborhood. Um, I think a development like this would really attract a lot more of the younger student demographic, um, which just sort of have different different ways of dealing with, with uh, outdoor and public space than we would probably like in the neighborhood. Um, if you look at um, looking at uh, section 2.7.1, uh, requires development to demonstrate result in forum, blah, blah, blah. Land use compatibility matters and mitigation measures may be used to achieve development and land use compatibility including but not limited to this whole list of things. And I mean, I think it's most of these things would actually apply to their proposed building, um, but I find it unlikely that they'll be able to actually mitigate all of these issues like shadowing. So, I mean, it's gonna be a significant re reduction in sunlight coming in to my backyard on my vegetable garden. Um, into my windows where all my plants are and things like that. I mean, those are things that are important and things that I enjoy in my house right now. Loss of privacy, obviously. Um, increased light pollution. Um, if it's a two and a half story, my house is only two stories and there's lights on in every room and lights on in the patio, that's a lot of light pollution at night. Uh, noise, odor, dust, vibration, all of the above. Um, increased level of traffic, obviously. Environmental damage and degradation, which we heard about to a certain extent um, from a hydrological point of view. Um, and just the list goes on. Um, and I agree that I don't think that this lot needs to stay empty or completely undeveloped, um, but it's important that they try and um, stay a little more in tune with what's actually going on in this neighborhood, and this development is, is just not there. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can suggest, if anybody has a written notes that they want to turn in to the, uh, um, to the clerk, that would be fine. So... Any further questions or comments? I will turn to the planner and staff to respond. Uh, thank you, and through you, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you for your feedback. I have received a lot of it in writing as of today, um, and take it very seriously, and we will take this back. Uh, I do wanna try to speak to some of the comments and concerns that have been mentioned, and I've been writing them down and have tried to consolidate them, hopefully, into some key themes. Um, you know, compatibility seems to be a major concern that we're hearing tonight. Um, and compatibility, from, from my perspective, from a, a planning perspective, boils down to two main components, one being uh, adverse impacts or negative impacts, which, which multiple people have spoken to, and I, I do just want to flip back to that slide. And it's really sort of a more tangible way of trying to wrap our heads around what those impacts might be and what is compatible and what isn't compatible. Um, from, from a shadow perspective, I mean, we, we often do shadow studies for new developments. They're typically required for sort of 10 stories and higher. Um, we don't expect significant shadow impacts just based on, on the height of the building. I do want to emphasize that the height that we're proposing uh, does meet both the A and B 
zone requirement. We aren't seeking any relief there. Um, typically, or not, not typically, always, based on the orientation of the sun, shadow impacts typically affect to the north of the property um, and do move, obviously, throughout the day. So at any given point, I don't think any one location or any one yard will be impacted by shadow uh, throughout the day. Loss of privacy due to intrusive overlook. I get that, that's a big one, um, especially when it comes down to this rooftop patio. I do want to emphasize the size of these patios. In fact, we're actually seeking relief to have smaller consolidated areas. They're roughly 400, 450 square feet. They can probably fit a patio set. Um, we can certainly look at screening techniques. I mean, in terms of overlook of a second story room versus an open patio, I think we're gonna have fairly similar trajectories of views. Um, from a noise perspective, we will be going through site plan control and noise is a consideration of that. Um, I would again emphasize just how, how separated these properties are rear yard setbacks of 18 and 21 meters providing significant separation from these rooftop patios two properties backing on to uh, this one uncomfortable wind speeds is, is not really a factor for shorter buildings uh, traffic yeah we're, we're proposing six parking spaces uh, on the one hand we're we have one shared park uh, shared driveway so currently there's one driveway we're maintaining one driveway we will see, uh, you know, certainly an increase of movement in and out of the of the site, but I don't think at six units we're going to see uh, major impacts to the traffic network. Um, environmental damage or degradation. Uh, we we did look to the official plan schedules related to natural heritage features. Um, in terms of what the provincial policy statement identifies as natural features that we need to protect and, and there aren't any identified on or in proximity of this property. Um, reduction in the ability to enjoy, enjoy a property. Again, um, your concerns are well noted uh, and, and we'll work through, I think, the site plan process to try to achieve a rooftop patio that uh, can provide, you know, a quality amenity space for, for the folks who, who will be living here, but not result in an excessive noise or overlook for other properties. Um, and then on the compatibility side of things, we also really look at, is this going to basically stick out and not fit within the established built form of the neighborhood? And I just want to, I guess, emphasize that what we're trying to achieve here is the look of a single family home from the street, from a built form compatibility perspective, but we actually have a few smaller units in it, uh, as opposed to one larger single detached dwelling. From a numbers perspective, yes, we need relief. We're over the 69 dwelling units per hectare. From a built form density perspective, which this zoning bylaw doesn't look at, um, we're more of a, a low, medium density form of housing. Um, storm water management and water. Uh, so we have prepared, uh, well, a civil engineer has prepared a serviceability and storm water management report and preliminary grading plans. Um, they should be available uh, for people to view we are working with Asterisk Engineering and they are proposing um, underground infiltration trench uh, at the rear of the property. As part of the city's requirements, we are obligated to ensure that post-development flows don't exceed pre-development flows. Uh, and we need to demonstrate that through grading drawings that are reviewed by the engineering department, approved by the engineering department, and implemented through site plan control. Uh, so we are proposing stormwater management on the site, recognize we are in, in increasing permeable services. Um, in terms of the amenity space at grade, we will certainly look at maintaining as much greenery as possible, as opposed to providing more of a you know paved surface uh, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. 
Um, the concern regarding setting a precedent of, of the B zone, um, I appreciate that concern. From a planning perspective, we always look at uh, a proposed planning application and review it on its individual merits. Um, so we are proposing three units here as opposed to two, which is the max currently permitted. Therefore, we fit within the parameters of the B zone, uh, which is why we're proposing this. Like I'd said, even though the zone permits up to six units, we practically can't achieve that uh, without going through an additional planning process. Uh, it's, it's too much building for the site and it's too many reliefs was another uh, concern I, I heard as well. Um, Again, want to emphasize that we are within the permitted height limits. Uh, the one property, we are not exceeding coverage requirements. Um, we are within the permitted height limits of both the A and B zone. Yeah, um, we certainly are requesting relief in a number of setbacks. Um, we feel that the six meter front yard setback is not appropriate for this property. It's not consistent with anything that we see on Montreal Street, and we wanted to create that consistent street front. Um, question about heritage. This isn't a designated or listed heritage building, um, so we weren't re required to prepare a heritage impact statement. Um, and I, yes, I'm familiar with the Pine Street project. That went from, from one unit to nine, I believe, through, through intensification. Um, I, hope I, I hope I addressed everything. I've taken a lot of notes, and we're certainly going to take this back and, and provide feedback uh, through technical circulation process with staff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no staff hands. Oh, I do see a staff hand. Go ahead. There just a, Mr. Chair, there are just a few uh, items that we want to clarify in response to Councillor Hutchison's comments and questions related to density uh, within the A zone and the B zones. So, uh, Councillor Hutchison, you're correct that obviously one and two family dwellings are permitted within the A zone and three to six are permitted within the B zone. The current lot area of the, the entire site is 710 square meters. So under the existing A zone permissions, they would actually only be able to develop one single detached unit on that property based on the minimum lot area requirement of 370 square meters per dwelling unit. So they would need 740 square meters of lot area in order to develop two units on that property. Um, the A zone also includes provisions related to FSI, so floor space index, which is one times the lot area. So essentially it looks at a calculation of gross floor area divided by the lot area. So it says that you can have a gross floor area that's equivalent to your lot area. So from a gross floor area perspective, they would be able to build a building that's 710 square meters. The proposed right now is 724 square meters. Um, there is obviously no maximum density as in terms of uh, the dwelling units per net hectare within the existing A zone, but those lot area requirements are actually another form of regulating density on the property. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> you're hiding. Thank you, and through you, and for the members of the public that are here tonight, obviously we've heard a number of concerns related to this proposal. I just wanted to reiterate from a process perspective that what we're having tonight in terms of the process is the public meeting where the applicant has the opportunity to propose what they would like to see, the, the permissions they are seeking, but this is the beginning of a technical process, and there will be a lot of back and forth and technical review from a staff perspective that will incorporate the concerns that we've heard tonight and the matter will come back at a future date. We don't have a date determined because we're just starting the process, but I wanted to make sure that people understood that there is no decision that's being made this evening and that this will come back for the committee's consideration at a future date. And a quick question for one of you. Uh, the uh, concerns about the hyd hydraulic just our report. Uh, will that report be on DASH uh, that will allow people, the public, to have access to the 
a hydrologist's report that recommends, uh, that makes the statement that this will not have a negative impact from the current state? Yes, and through you, so any technical information being reports, peer review letters, any of that type of information that comes in support of applications is uploaded through the portal, the DASH portal, so that members of the public are ac able to access all of the technical information that's been submitted with an application. Thank you, and a hydrologist's report will be part of that, will it? Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I will now go to uh, the committee. Councillor Sanic, followed. Uh, Great. One last question. It looks like there could be um, concerns with runoff for that back parking lot that has the three parking spots. So um, I just wondered if maybe permeable pavers could be considered, since it looks like you'll be going right on top of grass. And thanks. Thank you, Councillor Chappelle. Yes, uh, through you, Chair. Um, I have a question just for staff and the reporting process involved. This is the, f I, I know that uh, uh, Frank is, uh, oh, sorry, Ms. I forgot your last name, Frank. Dixon is always providing commentary, but today we have some additional uh, residents that are providing commentary. Through the planning process, do we, because they spoke, do we provide them with updates directly or is the onus on them to follow the file? I think I know the answer to that question. I think staff can probably answer it better. Oh. Through you, Mr. Chair, certainly anyone who speaks at planning committee at a statutory public meeting will be notified of any future public meetings or reports that will be coming forward to planning committee. There's always the opportunity also for any of the residents to contact either Sajid or I um, to have additional discussions and conversations about this file. So planning staff are available to residents at any point in time through the process to have uh, any dialogue, any questions, any hear any of your concerns, and, and certainly uh, we're happy to direct uh, any of the residents to the information through the DASH portal. It is a little bit challenging sometimes to access that if you haven't accessed it before, so we're certainly here to help and walk you through that. Um, to Councillor Neal's uh, note at the beginning of the meeting, please sign in on the sign-in sheet at the, the rear, so just to ensure we have your email address on file and ensure that we have uh, the proper contact information for sending out those notices. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll declare this public meeting finished and we'll now move up Highway 15. Uh, for our next uh, presentation. All right, good evening, everyone. My name's Nancy Wartman, and I'm a planner with IBI Group. Um, as you can see, I've got a whole, whole team of people with me this evening on this application. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce everyone, um, and then we'll get our presentation underway. So we also have Rob Snetzinger here from Ecological Services, who's the project biologist. Uh, we have Mike Bingham from Cambium, who's the hydrogeologist on the project. 
Um, and then we also have um, Bob Vasley, who's the owner and operator of Canadian Willastonite, who is the applicant for the project. And we also have his, his wife and his son, um, Janine and Aaron here, um, joining tonight as well. So we'll try and keep it as smooth as possible, but we'll kind of be passing amongst ourselves to, so everyone can speak to um, their areas of expertise this evening. So just to give you um, a very brief overview before I turn it over to Bob, who will provide some background. You may have never heard of Willastonite. You may be wondering um, about mining operations. He'll be able to speak to you um, about the project currently and some of the background information. So currently, Canadian Willastonite operates a, a Willastonite mine in the township of Leeds and Thousand Islands, which abuts the city of Kingston. It has a closure plan that has been acknowledged by the director of the Ministry of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, which was formerly um, just the Ministry of Northern Development and Mines um, in 2012, as per uh, the Mining Act. Planning Act approvals um, were re required in the township at that time, and um, the applications were subject to an OP OMB appeal and settlement um, way back in, in 2012 and 2013. So, the mineral deposit actually straddles the city of Kingston and the township of Leeds and Thousand Islands. It's right there on the property boundary. So where we're at is that Canadian last night is now proposing to expand extraction operations into the city of Kingston. And as such, um, a zoning bylaw amendment is required to place the expansion lands in an appropriate zone um, to be in conformance with the existing OP designation which exists on the lands. So I'll turn it over to Bob to give you some background. By the way, I won't be upset if nobody knows what well, last night is. It means I was doing my job fairly well for the last six years. <laughs> the, uh, I can't, let me just, so that I can see what it's doing. Um, just to give you a quick idea of where the land is, we're, um, we own the last two lots as far away out of the city of Kingston as you can be at the upper, at the northeast end. We also own four lots into Leeds and Thousand Islands. They're, uh, <clears throat> sorry, they're together. I'm not very good at this. So that'll give you a rough idea of the fabric. Um, in, owing, in owning lands in Kingston and Leeds and Thousand Islands, we've been doubly blessed of going through the permitting process in Leeds, uh, which we were successful at and we've been operating, as I said, since 2013, <clears throat> and the, as Nancy said, we're trying to push the operation into Kingston. Uh, by the way, that'll be a long, slow process into Kingston, but we're looking for the application to be approved now. Um, to give you an idea of the lands, this is a shot from 2005, and this is a shot from, it says 2015, I believe that shot is actually 2016, We've done a fair bit of enhancements. We've opened up the mining operation, but we've also done fairly significant wetland enhancements. We've done forestation. Um, Rob will speak a little bit more to that. This is a, uh, <clears throat> sorry, this is a picture. Rob, can I just borrow your water? <laughs> sorry. sorry. Can I just borrow a sip of water? Uh -oh. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Uh, this is a fairly recent shot of the operation. This is actually east, looking west into the city of Kingston from Leeds and Thousand Islands. Those who know me know I'm not a public speaker. I'm sorry. <laughs> Here's an aerial view of the, uh, of the mining complex or the uh, quarry from the south looking north. You can see proximity of Sealy's Bay in the upper northeast side, and that's the Rideau system that you see directly to the north. This is north looking south, so you can see that the site is, is largely an agricultural area. The mining uh, and our quarry operation is in a, a zone that is not agriculture. It's high in relief. It's actually a scar, so there is no arable land in, in what we're doing. So last tonight is a altered limestone, essentially. It has a good story. It, uh, it had to be buried about 15 to 25 kilometers deep. It had to be exposed to an awful lot of heat uh, for a very long period of time. So our particular deposit took about a million years to form. 
and it was formed about 1.2 billion years ago. And over that time, it's managed to come up to the surface, and at this point, it's, it's high in release, so it outcrops right on the surface area. Um, it is defined under the Mine Act as opposed to the Aggregate Resources Act. It's been designated by the province as a significant resource. The, um, <clears throat> sorry, we're regulated under the Northern Development of Mines or Mineral Mining Energy, sorry, Ministry, it's j just changed. So Ministry of Energy, Northern Development of Mines. Now it used to just simply be Northern Development of Mines. This is uh, just a shot. We primarily produce two products right now. We, we ship from the mine site into some value-added distributors that make a whole range of products. But the two products we produce is a coarse aggregate, roughly a half inch, which is very similar to all of the limestone operations that you currently have. And then we have a, a finer powder, which is going into environmental, <clears throat> sorry, environmental and agricultural applications. There's a limited number of mines in the world of Wollastonite. We are the only one in Canada. There's three in North America, and as I say, there's about a handful around the world. Um, the deposit, and this is probably important for people to understand, the deposit is right on the surface. So the building that you see on the lower left-hand side, um, it's housing some ore for us, and we basically keep it dry. That's the pit floor. And that pit, and the, the extension we're coming into the city, is from that level, which is three meters above Highway 15. So although you normally think of a mine as a hole that's going into the ground, this is actually going to be a, a, a horizontal extraction that just simply moves into the scar, which is very high in relief. Um, our mining, the, the peak of the scar is up to 50 meters. Uh, from our pit floor and 53, 54 meters above Highway 15. So if you drive up to the site, uh, and you'll know the site if you go up there, we have a great big stone and knock shuck by a gate if anybody travels up Highway 15, it's about 20 feet tall. Uh, but if you drive up there, you'll see a large scar in behind where we actually live, the house and the commercial entrance. That face won't change, but in behind that is actually where the mining operation is taking place. Um, we're selling into, we've developed applications uh, since, well actually, nobody knows what Wollastonite is, so a large part of what we do is, is research and development and teaching people what it can be used for. We're, we've, over since 2013 until now, we've, we've developed some strong applications that are going into environmental remediation, phosphorus absorption. You'll see some letters that accompany our application from some of our research, researchers which the research is now starting to be published, and it's, it's, it's very strong. We're producing it as a soil amendment. We're selling it into agriculture and horticultural applications. We're selling it into livestock applications. Um, and some of our larger markets are industrial slags, like synthetic slags and steel making. And um, cement production is one of the ones that we're, we've been asked to look at uh, fairly strongly. What last night does is a silicate mineral. It's a source of calcium, magnesium, and silicon that you can derive from non-carbonate sources. So by definition, it automatically saves CO2. Carbonate sources release about half their weight in CO2 when the oxides come out. Well, last night reduces, releases no CO2. So that's one of the strong benefits, but it also captures CO2. And you'll, you'll read that in a fair bit of the research, some of which is, is commented on the application. Um, you'll read a lot more about that in sort of the next year or two and on our site right now. Interestingly, we shipped, well, last night, um, we've got one small one here. We're not developing it <laughs> strongly yet, but we made a countertop, and we've got a fair bit of interest in what it looks like as a polished stone. We actually, I can proudly say, shipped some well, last night from Kingston to Italy for polishing. I don't know if we're going to ship a whole lot much more, but I'm quite happy that we shipped at least one container load. Um, we've done a fair bit since opening, so just talking a little bit about the R&D. To date, we've spent over a million dollars in research and development for, for different universities and institutions. Currently, I have 14 research projects underway at uh, showing nine, but it's actually 10 universities and research institutions this year. 
Um, they've been very successful at, at bringing new markets for us in developing uh, or, or proving the science of, of Wellastonite. In terms of economic impacts, um, since we started to today, we've spent more than $6 million largely in local goods and services. Um, we estimate over the life of the mine, a minimum estimate is, will be $100 million of inputs. And uh, in terms of other, the property taxes as an industrial and as a mining operation goes up significantly, in, the, in our case, tenfold over agricultural. I think I'll pass it over to Rob. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, before I start, I've been coming to council chambers for many years, and this lamp here, I can't stop looking at it because it reminds me of a, a shrub I often see when I'm doing research up north. It's called the button bush. There's a picture of it there. But uh, just type in button bush in Google Images, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, so Bob's talked about some of the, the many applications with respect to pollution abatement and uh, other applications. You just need to type in Google Scholar into uh, some of the uh, applications for Wellastonite in this regard, but I'm going to focus on um, carbon help me out here. sequestration. Uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, I guess there was a, a meeting here on Tuesday for strategic, strategic planning and uh, global warming, climate change was a big issue for many people. Um, and of course, Kingston's got a climate action plan, and Kingston's gotten awards for their climate initiatives. So in this regard, Wellastonite fits in well with that. Uh, one of the research papers and, uh, undertaken is uh, Lee Chang from Uni University of Waterloo, and she estimates in a soil amendment application, it's the equivalent of three million tons of carbon dioxide from this particular mine. That's quite significant. That can be equated to about 18 million trees. Um, I th think this is a really good model for people who strive for kind of a green economy. We're doing good things, but uh, it's also economically uh, beneficial. Uh, furthermore, if you type in carbon sequestration uh, and wellastonite in Google Scholar, you'll find all sorts of uh, uh, research there. Um, other positives. Um, Reversing uh, historical farm-related impacts, so the Brady Creek wetland uh, more or less starts beside the property, extends uh, eastward and southward into South Lake. Um, it has a long history of farming impacts uh, through drainage alterations, nutrient impacts, uh, sedimentation, cattle grazing. And so the bulk of the, the wetland um, that's next to the, to the uh, Wallacenite mine and further downstream is heavily impacted, and you can, this is evident in a very dense monoculture of cattails and certain carrick species, so it's, it's got very low biodiversity. Um, what they would like to do is reverse some of that trends on the parts of the wetland that they own. There's a variety of mechanisms that are, con are being considered. One is interspersion, drain, uh, interspersion dredging, which is a, a restoration technique used by MNR. It's also been used by CRCA. There's a project at the mouth of Little Cat uh, wetland where this has been undertaken. Or alternatively, there'll be some project with Ducks Unlimited to try to bring back some quality to this, this highly impacted wetland. Uh, at their own initiative, this wasn't mandated, but their own initiative, so the mine operators have uh, developed wetlands. And in the image up there, that water portion that's in the sort of the bottom part of the image, that's the created wetland, and that kind of drab, if I can say monoculture, off to the upper left there, that's the actual uh, wetland, the Brady Creek wetland. The developed wetland has got much higher biodiversity and wetland attribute features. Uh, it's, it's brought in snapping turtles, which weren't here before. It's brought in water snakes. It's brought in wood ducks. It's brought in a really good diverse uh, amphibian population. They're almost absent in the actual wetland further, further to the north. Really about the only species active in any numbers, red-winged blackbirds in the the established wetland versus the man-made one here. Um, and also, this, it also attracts waterfowl. So um, it's interesting to me that they have done this because they want to, because they're keen, because they like the idea of sustainable development, and not because anybody said, you have to do this. Oh, next slide. 
Uh, likewise, um, in anticipation of some forest loss, uh, they've purchased extra land, including the, the farm property to the north. So there's a lot of extra land here for compensation projects. Um, not just for, uh, for forestry, they hope to do some agricultural experimentation and projects related to Wallacenite as well as horticulture. Uh, to date, they've planted 17,000 trees. Um, and I just I brought up a number from the city's website. So it's about 30,000 municipally owned trees in the city of Kingston, the K Kingston urban area, so just as a comparison. In the top photo there, uh, you can see the mine road, and you can see the mine to the left. Um, that's one area where the trees are planted. That's not the only area. But what's interesting about that area is a little bit further east of that is the Brady Creek itself and a little bit of the wetland. So again, at their own initiative, they put in a, a tree buffer. Uh, these trees here are about eight years old. Uh, they're getting up to average 10 feet, but uh, uh, you won't be able to see the creek area within about, I don't know, about five or 10 years. Um, nesting programs that they've established so far, again, this wasn't mandated, this was just out of their own interest for turtles, for bats, uh, bluebirds, uh, purple martins. Uh, the population of purple martins in Ontario right now is down to about 15,000. Um, I think about half of those are on Bob's property. Uh, snake projects, uh, an osprey uh, platform, or maybe an eagle will like it instead. Um, again, this wasn't mandated, there weren't ospreys on the property. Uh, the mine operators hope to bring them in, uh, and wood ducks as well. Uh, hibernacular nesting programs that are planned, and again, these aren't mandated. They're going to build hibernacula to try to attract snakes to the area. Um, we've got some good sites picked out that may be possible for that. Likewise with turtles for nesting programs. Uh, there's whippoorwills on the adjacent property. Um, what typically happens in my experience with, uh, with operations, this has similarities to a quarry in terms of its physical appearance. Uh, these attract whippoorwills, but these can be enhanced by doing forest uh, gap, gap um, production. We've been involved in whippoorwill restoration projects, and, and typically what you do if you've got an area that has attributes, you go into a nearby forest and you create these nesting gaps because the whippoorwills lay their, lay their eggs in the, in the gaps, and then they, they fly past the forest into the open areas which would be the sort of the, the mine area to feed at night. They're only active at night. And likewise, barn swallows. There are no barn swallows on the property, um, but I see a lot of potential for them because the, the area does have attributes, but barn swallows need these structures, and the old adage, if you build it, they will come. So they hope to attract uh, barn swallows to the site as well. So Bob's been working on this project for a long time, perhaps even longer than I've been alive. I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm afraid to ask. But um, there have been some recent de planning developments um, in the past few years that are relevant to the application that I'll, I'll just quickly um, give you some background on. So in 2017, um, when the city underdid, undertook uh, their five-year OP update, um, the majority of the la last night deposit was identified um, on the land use planning schedule in the official plan. Uh, however, it, we did request that it be expanded to reflect the extent that is recognized by the province. So through the five-year OP update, um, that change was made and, and the last night deposit did um, expand um, a little bit. Um, in 2018, um, as we mentioned, the deposit straddles um, both the city of Kingston and the township of Leeds in Thousand Islands. And between um, the lands owned by Canadian Will last night is a municipal unopened road allowance jointly owned by the two municipalities. So to enable um, an expansion through um, from one side to the other, um, we needed to um, look at some options of how this would work with the road allowance separating the two properties. Um, we worked with, with both municipalities trying to figure out what would work best, closure, realignment, leasing, um, what were some options. Um, eventually, we came to an agreement to do a land swap um, and realign uh, the road allowance and then enter into a lease um, where the road allowance um, goes. On the next slide, I'll, I'll show you how it's been realigned. Uh, also in 2018, uh, we did do a zoning bylaw amendment in the Township of Leeds and Thousand Islands. 
Kanitamu last night had acquired some land um, adjacent to the existing mine site and we rezoned um, some lands to accommodate ancillary activities. Um, in preparation for the expansion into the city of Kingston, we also amended the existing zoning on the mine site in um, TLTI um, so that there would be zero setback to enable um, that expansion right from uh, TLTI into city of Kingston. Um, in 2019, the, the land sale was, was finalized um, and Canadian Will last night acquired a large chunk of land, 91.2 hectares, uh, adjacent to the mine site. So hopefully this map will provide some clarity to what I just um, indicated. So in orange is the existing um, operating mine site. Um, this is the municipal uh, boundary that runs up and down, Township of Leeds and Thousand Islands on the, on the right on the screen and City of Kingston on the left. Um, so the unopened road allowance ran straight through. Um, as we were working, um, there was concerns about how after the mining operations were done, how the road allowance would be, would be left. So what we ended up doing was swapping uh, these lands here with these uh, lands here, if you can see that on there, um, so that the end profile um, of the land would enable sort of the facilitation of a road should it ever be built. Uh, these were the lands acquired on the TLTI side. Um, and then this little portion here was the portion rezoned, again, not for extraction, but just to um, provide extra lands for um, storage and some ancillary operations. Um, the lands on the city of Kingston side that we are looking to rezone are the lands shown um, in red with the full extent of the property shown um, in the deep red boundary. So the requested uh, zoning bylaw amendment um, is to enable the expansion of the extraction operations as I've indicated. Um, we are required to place the expansion lands in an appropriate site-specific extractive industrial zone. Um, and the zoning needs to be in place before formally filing the closure plan amendment uh, with the ministry, which is a, um, a provincial process. In terms of the surrounding uh, uses in the area, Bob spoke to this um, briefly. It is generally in a rural agricultural area. There are a number of existing dwellings um, in, the er in the area, um, which have been indicated on the image um, in yellow, um, but otherwise just sort of agricultural uses and, and scrubland in the area. So I'll actually turn it over to Mike now to um, speak through some of the more technical aspects um, of the project and to, to outline the site plan for you. Good evening. Um, just to put that in context with how long it's been in operation, I have a son in secondary university. When I was in secondary university, I did a pump test on this property, working for another company a couple years ago. So obviously been around for a while, this operation. Um, so I'm just going to run through a little bit, but rather than look at the actual, cool. rather than look at text, I'm going to uh, just bring up the site plan. And I'll go the right way. Um, so this is the general area, the site plan, the area that we looked at before. Let's see how shaky I can be. Um, that would be the, the area in red that we looked at on the last slide, which extends the extraction operation from TLTI into Kingston. And I think it's important to note that that will be advanced in that direction. Now if we just zoom in a little bit more so I can be a little less shaky, um, the white area, the contours on there are the final pit contours. So you can see water in this area is gonna flow here to this pond and out, and vice versa across here. But that slope is very gradual. It'll be basically a rock flat floor at grade um, and not extending down below the grade that's established now. It's going to go up so it flows back towards it. Um, overburden and mine rock stockpiling will be in this area here, the operation, and in this answer area on the, uh, uh, that was newly, recently rezoned. Um, the operations going into the Kingston side will be extractive and uh, basically just knocking the, 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 the face down and taking the blast material and bringing it to the processing area. Um, and then continuing on with the extraction. It'll be similar to what you always saw on on, uh, how, on the 401 where um, Montreal Road was kind of pushed back in as a horizontal over the last few years. Uh, you would have saw that rock face that was, that was close to the highway that was moved back to, to, to accommodate the additional areas. 
This is a similar type of operation where we're just moving it back. Um, surface water retention pond that you see there, there's one here. These are obviously aren't established yet because we haven't, we haven't mined into this area yet. These are what are operating at the present time. Um, and then a small portion of these are ponds that aren't connected to any, any drainage offsite. They're, they have the ability to be filled, um, but they can be used for uh, washing stone. So clean water out of one, through the rock, discharging the other to sediment uh, for their sediment removal. Um, berms and um, stockpiles, I can't see, I believe it's this area in here that have been built, constructed to date. The um, access roads are in red, or you can see coming in from either property, Bob and Janine's house is right here. And, um, and the buildings that are on site now are, are over here and proposed over in this area as well. Um, There's a 15 meter setback from the site or the CPA boundary. We call it CPA. It's a closure plan amendment boundary. It's a closure plan boundary. So that's the area in which the closure plan closure plan is in effect. The extraction area is 15 meters uh, inside that area um, or more. The extraction is looking at 30 to 40 thousand tons uh, per year of the last night. Um, that does require the uh, additional extraction of materials around that. The distinction between the Mining Act and the Aggregate Act, if you're not familiar, um, would be one is, one is for, for, for minerals and one is for aggregate. Aggregates are a little less selective in that they, they continue to advance the face for uh, an aggregate product, whereas the mineral it has to chase wherever the mineral with deposit was uh, uh, laid 1.2 billion years ago. So it's a little more selective in that process, and the, and the, the Mining Act was established to look at the, uh, uh, sorry, to, to um, control how that was done so that we weren't left with uh, the places that um, were hazardous, basically. So uh, the Mine Act looks at it uh, very similar to the Aggregate Resource Act in terms of studies, um, and you'll see if I go through the studies, and I'll try to go through them fairly quick at a higher level, but they are the same ones you're going to see for an, ag for an aggregate extraction, for the most part. The rehabilitation in this case is um, progressive like the Aggregate Resource Act um, in phases, and we establish rehabilitation as we advance, in, in advance of, of, uh, of mining in this case. I imagine we'll come back to this during questions, but I'll just uh, move along to this, the technical studies that have been undertaken to date. Uh, stormwater management, actually I'll just, this is the general, rather than reading them off twice. Um, stormwater, stormwater control, so we have a stormwater management report that we started in 2016 by uh, uh, DM Wills. They, it was updated by uh, DM Wills in 2018 um, in consideration of reviews from uh, Cataract Ray region. So when we looked at the zoning on the TLTI side, um, it required buy-in or, or uh, approval from the, the uh, Conservation Authority. So they looked at the reports, they gave us comments, we went back, redid the studies, or updated them to, which included all of the drainage for the Kingston side as well, because it all flows out through that one area that I showed you, I didn't actually show you, through this area here at present. So, and the whole area is covered by CRCA, so they were concerned with it. That's where this study came from. And that's where the scope, oops, sorry. Um, so basically they'll be, they'll be monitored, or they'll be managed on site through stormwater management ponds. The water that falls onto the quarry floor runs out through these ponds. There's retention in those ponds that are adequate through, that we've determined through modeling that they're adequate to hold the water long enough that the sediment drops out, clean water flows off into to Brady Creek. Brady Creek. Um, on top of that, we also do monitoring on an annual basis uh, where we look at the water coming in and out of each pond, into the creek, coming into the property and out of the creek, going out the other side of the property, and compare those to look and see what if there's any impacts and any modifications required as a basis. So I'll get to that in a second, the results of that, sorry. Um, blasting, so blasting um, is a typical concern with, with uh, rock operations, mining operations, coring operations. They do create a detonation which is required to break that rock loose. Um, so the study is done in the, in the forefront to look at um, how the rock will break up, what kind of blasting would, it, would, uh, would be required, and then what kind of shock waves are going to be released and how far those are going to travel and do they have hazard damages. So that initial study was done. 
Um, and then each time they blast, the blasting contractor comes in, they set up blast monitors to look at the vibrations, and they have a threshold they have to meet. And for all the blasts that have been done, three to four, uh, two to three a year, over the last several years, we haven't even come close to any, uh, any thresholds that's been established by the ministry. Um, and uh, archaeological, archaeological, it's not my area of expertise, but if I speak slow enough, I can say it. Um, so that study was cleared. Basically, a stage one goes through, identifies any of the, any of the archaeological issues that, that could be present, and whether a stage two would be necessary. Stage two was not necessary, and then it gets submitted to the Ministry of Tourism, Culture, and Sport, I believe, and um, they acknowledge it and they say, okay, you're, that's, yeah, you're clear based on what you've done in that first stage. There's no further study for any archaeological resources present on site. A uh, traffic impact study was done in 2013 and again updated in 2014. The, the haul routes are established for the TLTI set at, at present. It's all approved. It's uh, MTOs had their buy in and the uh, counties had their uh, requirements. It's been established. There's no additional tonnage, annual tonnage. There's no additional. Um, Nothing that's going to change with moving into the extraction in the Kingston side that's going to change anything with the actual traffic that you would see today. Uh, noise studies. Um, we recently received an ECA for the TLTI side. Can I say that? That leads Thousand Islands. Um, so it has conditions in place. Uh, the approval was originally applied for the whole area, and the minister said that you got to get your zoning and OP first, and then you can get an AECA, so the ECA will be amended again once we once zoning and, and uh, uh, approval has been granted, and then we can apply for the ECA for the Kingston side. But basically, it takes the, into consideration for the site what's required, to, to, uh, who the receptors are, um, uh, what the material, what the, what the equipment is on site, and how much noise is generated, the hours of operation. Um, speed limits and, and berming and all the rest of that. You set it up in the model to, so you can establish what what kind of controls you need to control the noise so you don't drive your neighbors crazy. Uh, the part, part, uh, important takeaway from this, that's not on the slide, is that the operation is actually moving away from the majority of the receivers that we see. So actually improving the situation. Uh, so hydrogeology, um, again, again, I know there is a, this city is, is very sensitive to hydrogeology with some of the, some of the uh, historical concerns with quarries and dewatering and issues with people's losing water and whatnot in a specific case that happened 30 years ago. That's uh, on the minds of everybody when we talk about hydrogeology in terms of the quarrying or, or egg extraction process. Um, this is, again, I, if you go back to that sort of analogy, when you look at Montreal Road where you're pushing back, you're not looking at, at, at uh, going deeper into the ground, and we're not actually going below grade where we are today, we're going uphill, uh, and pushing back the rock, the, any groundwater that's coming out of the rock face now will continue to come out of the rock face, but just further back. It'll be collected as opposed to running over land and collecting the creeks, it'll come across the quarry floor into the sedimentation ponds and into the creek as it does today. Um, so several studies were done back in 92. The phase one study, I believe it was done before, prior to you. Oh my goodness, there we go. That was before I went to school. Uh, and then 2007, there was an additional study done um, in preparation for approvals on the TLTI side and the initial closure plan. The, um, in, in, in that process, over those four years, um, BGC Engineering was brought on. It's actually the same hydrogeologist. They're just a different company at this point. And to revolve or bring that um, characterization study up to the standards that are required on the closure plan. There's a code that, that dictates um, what is required in terms of that study, and that studies have to meet those. And they go through a review process at the ministry, and the ministry circulates it to other ministry agencies that are concerned with surface water or groundwater being whatever that may be, um, environment or, or natural resources, and bring comments back, send it back to the proponent who updates reports, and this is why we have so many reports on this. Um, but the and general takeaway from that is that this went through a process, uh, 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 review process at the closure plan stage, it went through a review process at the OMB stage for the TLTI sides, and the outcome is the same, the study area was the same. 
And the 2018 study that we're talking about is a monitoring report. So that was when I went back to the talking about the water in, the water out. We also look at the groundwater in terms of levels, in terms of flows, and have monitoring in there that instruments and uh, identify anything that changes as a result of the advancement of mining. Um, to date, there's been no uh, impacts reported, either from surface water or groundwater. And probably, again, to reiterate, which I heard on some of the earlier um, presentations, were that these reports are available through DASH, I believe. And with that, I will hand it back to you. Back to Rob. That's what I meant, you. To, thought I would have figured that out by now. Talk about the natural heritage aspects. Thank you. Thanks. I forgot to mention when I was talking about carbon sequestration is uh, we used that number because there was some research and it was a good solid number. But the number could actually be much higher in terms of the amount of carbon dioxide pulled uh, from the atmosphere or related work um, from the wallacinite and other products of the mine. Um, so the three million was actually a conservative estimate. Uh, so we undertook the natural heritage assessment work uh, from 2011 and 2018. Uh, the bulk of the original work was on the lead side, but we've covered the whole property uh, throughout all our visits. Uh, that's through 29 survey visits in that time. Um, just for comparison, um, some of you may know we've been doing this work a long time, and a typical uh, project typically requires about five to ten survey visits. So we've gone well above what is normally done. Uh, we followed the standard criteria, the standard processes outlined in the documents that were required to follow, such as the Natural Heritage Reference Manual, the Ministry of Natural Resources Significant Wildlife uh, Manual, the Wetland Manuals, et cetera. So it, it's, a, it's all um, work that's uh, set, um, and we just follow the guidelines and rules of how it's to go. Um, species at risk, uh, there is a single butternut found at the extreme western end of the property. Uh, based on projections given to me by the mine operators, it will be about uh, 50 years before the mine gets near that butternut tree. The butternut tree is currently cankered, so it'll probably be dead in 50 years. But um, we uh, would expect a, a butternut health assessment to be undertaken at that time if the mine gets within 30 meters of that butternut. There's also a bunch of butternuts on the adjacent property further west. It's a different habitat. It's interesting because once you hit the boundary, you, the actually nature of the ecology changes radically uh, from the, the, beg me on this, the FOD 5-4 forest, which is the bulk of the Wallacinite forest, to a uh, rock barren forest on the adjacent property, which uh, lends itself to butternut growth. Um, there's also... Uh, uh, Whippoorwills on the adjacent property, and again, when we get within that distance, further surveys will be required. But again, I expect whippoorwills will move in to the quarry property over time because they'll be attracted to the, sorry, I shouldn't say quarry, mine property, uh, because they're attracted to that kind of habitat. So in a sense, this is a plus, the, the mine operation in that regard. You see a compatible, uh, compatible use, as they are with quarries. Um, Woodlands wildlife, um, there was a riparian valley uh, running through the woodland. Um, it doesn't have a lot going for it, but it is a riparian valley. Uh, the mine will be mostly 120 meters away from the valley, so that's not really a concern. Um, there, there's, we have asked for a 20 kilometer an hour speed limit, and uh, we're pushing for driver education, so that'll be honored for the property. Uh, any forest clearing that's required, and again, the projection is removing about 15 meters a year, so it's going to be a very slow process of moving across. It's not like they're going to strip the site in the first year. Um, so before they clear, they'll, uh, they'll, sorry, they won't clear during the bird breeding season to honor the Migratory Birds Act. Um, there'll be more woodland established to offset any losses. Um, that again, that act, actual number needs to be determined, but you need to know that the bulk of that woodland is where the mine's going is already cleared land for access roads. The forest is crisscrossed with ATV trails. They've been logging in the forest for firewood for, uh, for 25 years. It's, an, it's a, the forest is typical of a kind that reestablishes on pasture 
which is what this land used to be used for as pasture. So the bulk of the trees are younger in the 40 to 50 year range. Um, anyway, another thing we're pushing for, um, and the mine operators are quite happy to oblige, is having an eco passage um, between the, the developed wetland that they've, they've made and the adjacent uh, wetland, uh, existing wetland, to allow for uh, passage of primarily amphibians and reptiles between the two uh, wetlands. Um, we've been involved in these passages and other projects. They're pretty easy to do. It's basically an extra large box culvert. Um, you don't see wetland up there. There is wetland, of course, I've talked about it. The Brady Creek is a significant wetland, but the Kingston Side Mine is more than 120 meters away from, from the wetland, so that's not an issue of concern. Uh, fish habitat is really not a concern either because Brady Creek itself is more than 120 meters away from the proposed mine boundary. However, there is a farm drainage channel that connects to Brady Creek. Uh, would be very low quality fish habitat, but it's conceivable that fish could swim up that uh, farm drain, and that's within 110 meters of the, uh, the, uh, the mine boundary. So a very low risk potential here, but regardless, the standard water protection features will be put in place, such as silt barriers and hay bale barriers and what have you. Mm. Yeah. All right, I'll just run through the planning matters now and take us through to the end of the presentation until we get to the, the questions. Uh, so in terms of policy context, uh, well, last night was specifically identified in the 2014 PPS for protection and extract extraction, um, in part due to, to bar a lot of Bob's work. Um, and the PPS directs minerals to be protected for long-term use, um, to have mining operations and known min mineral deposits protected from development that would inhibit their expansion or extraction. Um, and then the province also requires them to undertake uh, progressive rehabilitation. So uh, the direction from the province is quite clear about protecting uh, natural resources. Um, and in our opinion, it is the proposed development is consistent with the intent of the PPS. In terms of the local OP, uh, the subject lands as a whole, our designated mineral resource will last tonight, uh, rural and environmental protection. The portion that will be subject to extraction um, are the ones that are already designated uh, mineral resource will last tonight, shown in gray there. Um, you may notice that, oh, but there's a finger of environmental protection. Um, Rob. Um, worked very closely with CRCA and staff, um, and it ended up that it was actually a desktop error, um, and that is being removed um, through a staff amendment. There's also, um, you may notice if you've got a very keen eye, a teeny tiny sliver up here that it appears to be rural, um, which is actually um, the resource, um, and again, the OP contains um, policies in section nine um, about boundary interpretation. Obviously, in this case, um, it's very, very difficult to sort of follow um, the mineral as Mike was kind of describing how it forms. So, um, uh, in, in terms of the uses permitted within the designation, your permitted extraction and processing of wollastonite and ancillary minerals. Um, as well as associated operations such as crushing, screening, washing, um, and other similar operations, um, such as those proposed. So the expansion um, or the creation of a new mineral operation does require a zoning bylaw amendment, and when we are requesting one, um, we need to look at the um, tests outlined in section 3.16.3 of the official plan, um, which considers a number of matters, which I'll just quickly run through. Um, we need to be thinking about the location and impact on adjoining communities. So the site is located on Highway 15, um, and we are expanding away um, from Sealy's Bay, and as Mike mentioned, away from um, existing development. In terms of the size, scale, and the nature of the use, um, as I mentioned, it is an expansing, expansion to the existing mining operation, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean operations are, are um, expanding tenfold. Uh, the numbers listed um, are the um, amounts anticipated and which the studies considered. 
In terms of compatibility with adjacent uses, um, as Mike outlined, a number of technical studies were completed um, and updated over a number a number of years um, that demonstrate that no adverse effects as per section 2.7.3 of the official plan. Uh, we also need to consider resource potential, and in this case, the province has recognized the full extent um, of the Wolastonite well deposit, um, and that uh, work has already been completed. In terms of site access, traffic volumes, haul routes, uh, again, that's where um, the traffic impact study um, evaluated all of that. We are, will be using the existing um, entrance, which is approved um, by MTO. Um, with respect to the other policies contained within the official plan, uh, the proposal is consistent with the city structure, um, rural area objectives um, in terms of protecting natural resources. Um, it's not anticipated to create adverse effects as demonstrated through the technical studies, as I mentioned. Um, the EIS has demonstrated that there's no significant impacts um, on identified EPA areas, which Rob was just speaking to, and the separation distances, um, as well as natural heritage systems. And 17,000 trees have been planted to compensate uh, for forest coverage loss uh, through, the, through the operations. So in summary, the request is consistent with the intent of the official plan. Getting now into the zoning um, within zoning bylaw 3274, um, it is currently zoned general agricultural in an A2 zone, and we are proposing a new site-specific extractive industrial zone. Uh, the new site-specific zone um, will expand the permitted uses of the parent MX uh, zone and add provisions um, that were established through the OMB hearing on the TLTI side. TLTI side. So um, we're just making sure that the zoning that we're proposing is consistent uh, with what had already gone to the OMB um, on the Leeds and Thousand Islands side. The requested rezoning is appropriate given the principle of development has been established through the OP designation as supported by the province and the tests have been met in the official plan with respect to expanding operations as demonstrated um, by the technical studies which we've just briefly outlined um, to this evening but will be reviewed um, by staff as part of the technical process. So in summary, uh, we are of the opinion that the requested zoning bylaw is appropriate, it's consistent with the PPS, conforms to official plan policies, um, and therefore represents good planning and is in the public interest. In, as I mentioned, this process has been um, very lengthy for Bob getting uh, even the existing mine site up and, up and running, and even with the planning approvals um, on the Kingston side, you may think that he's already, with this, that would be the last step, but I'll just quickly outline sort of what he still would need to go through. So, provided the zoning is approved here um, in the city of Kingston and no appeals filed, the Planning Act approvals uh, will be satisfied that he needs, um, but then he still requires approval under the Mining Act, so that's um, a process that is administered uh, by the Ministry of Energy and Northern Development Mines. So a draft amendment to the existing closure plan has been submitted for, for preliminary review by them, but again, we need to have the zoning in place before um, that process can, can move forward. Um, once they formally file the closure plan amendment, um, it will be circulated to the municipality and all sister municipalities, or sister ministries for comment. Um, um, by, and back to, those comments will go back to the ministry um, prior to them accepting the closure plan amendment. And then um, further regulation beyond that, all sort of the on-site operations um, are further regulated by various ministries. So um, while we're having the public meeting uh, here tonight and hopefully we work through uh, the technical comments with staff and eventually get it back here uh, for a decision, there is um, further approvals he will have to go through um, moving forward. So with that, um, we'd be happy to answer any questions um, from the committee and, and uh, the public. Thank you very much. I'll turn to, turn to staff uh, to comment on this, if you would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, notice of this public meeting has been provided in accordance with the Planning Act in the form of signs posted at the subject property 20 days in advance of this evening's meeting as well as notices being mailed to all 14 property owners of properties within 120 meters of the subject property. To date, um, staff have received a number of pieces of correspondence which have either been included in the 
main, uh, the staff report or the correspondence section of the main agenda, as well as the addendum to this evening's meeting. And I'll also note that a uh, courtesy notice was placed in the Kingston Wig Standard on February 12th. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Hill. What's the legacy of this mine? Life expectancy? How long do you expect this mine to be in operation? We expect it probably 50 to 60 years. And, and I'm, I'm assuming that uh, um, you've now sort of secured all the land that contains the deposit, or is there, will that sort of begin to expand out through you? We don't, we don't, within the 50 to 60 years, we don't have to expand out. Okay. And in terms of, in, in terms of remediation, Sorry? Sorry to interrupt. Could you use the microphone so everybody can hear? Thank you. So just... The first is sufficient that we own and hold title to for roughly 50 to 60 years of production. Okay, thank you. And the, uh, in terms of remediation, so when, uh, as you, you sort of um, extract the mineral, you, I presume... Um, rehabilitate the land as you move? Is that the way it works? The, the rehabilitation for this project, the um, progressive rehabilitation is building the necessary berms and walls to prevent inadvertent access. Uh, the finished mine site will actually be for commercial use, for commercial horticultural and food production over a long period of time. Okay, and then my last question is around the ponds. So my, my understanding is the ponds are like, they're settling ponds basically that the uh, the water eventually seeps out of the ponds, and the and the what's left, the residue, is that s safe? I guess I could probably yes, through you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that's correct. It is a it operates as a sedimentation pond. Um, there's a series of ponds that go through that slow down the water, hold a, a, a retention time enough that the particle size and the gravity of that particle can drop out under various storm events. They're modeled, I believe, for the 25-year storm. So under that scenario, at full build-out, the turbidity that's expected in the water, the sediments expected in the water, the size and the weight of it, will be able to be withheld in that pond long enough that it'll drop it out to reduce it to a water quality that's acceptable to be discharged off-site. As it is now, it is a flow-through system. Right. So it operates full, and it doesn't really percolate through into the ground a whole lot. And the remaining sediment, is that a pollutant or is that, is that? No, through you again, Mr. Chair, the, the, the material itself is inert for all intended purposes. There's been studies and classifications on the, on the material itself in terms of its uh, ability to either uh, produce acid rock drainage, which is a big concern with most mines. Um, and that's not the case. This actually has the, the uh, buffering effect the opposite direction. And through the monitoring that is ongoing, uh, we demonstrate that on an annual basis that the water coming in and going out off-site is within standards that uh, won't cause a problem. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Any from the committee? Yes, Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, um, I have four questions, and the first one's educational. So um, for, well, last tonight, if I'm saying it right, um, what makes this area so good <laughs> or so rich in it? Is it the limestone or if could we make a mining site like in Lindsay or, you know, like north of, north of Toronto? What is it in the soil or in this topography that makes this? I was just really surprised to find out that if there's, we're the only site in Canada or it might have been North America. And it's like, I just wondered what makes our area so rich in it. Is that okay? Um, it's, it's a very good question. There are some deposits, there's some known occurrences that were last night in multiple areas across Canada. You have to have a, a, a convergence of a bunch of factors. The deposit has to be large enough. It had to be created in a geological setting to allow the crystals to form completely. In this particular case, Kingston, which was part of Africa and then away from Africa at the time, um, provided that setting. So you needed the temperature, you needed the pressure, you needed the heat, and it, it basically started as a limestone though. So there's, there's a reason there is no other well, last night 
mines in Canada, because there's very few of them that have all of those factors that, that come together. Um, Kingston's Limestone City, and it really did start as a limestone product. It just went through an awful lot of uh, metamorphosis. Okay, thank you. Looking at that picture there, um, and you have your green laser pointer, which I'm really happy that you brought it. So where exactly are you expanding out? Is it to the south, like to the bottom of that picture, to the left, to the right, or to the top? So essentially, the, I'm going to be too shaky. Um, that's looking west. So the push is to the west. It's going to follow that line, and then it's going to dogleg the way the deposit does down to the south. The deposit is actually uh, kind of a semicircle of formation. There's some other rock minerals, but the main will last tonight actually is a semicircle uh, that comes to fairly abrupt end around lot 37, lot 36. Okay, thanks. Because uh, when I originally a newspaper article last week, there is um, a part in the newspaper article that said that no forest was affected. And I know you said tonight that only 15 meters per year, so that's heading to the top, like 15 meters per year. But when I read the article, I actually thought that maybe you were expanding like to the right, which I guess would be to the west, right? That that was my hope tonight, but. It is only 15 meters per year, eh? And um, where Councillor Hill just asked what the life expectancy will be, and um, you said probably 50 or 60 years, but you've just opened since 2013. Is, is that what you said when you originally opened as well? So like, what I'm wondering is, <laughs> over that 50 to 60 span of like the next 50 or 60 years, are you gonna be taking you know, like more forest, you know, to the left, which I guess is to the east. Like, is that entire area going to be chewed, all the forest going to be chewed up over the next 50 years? The, the forest oil mine has to be taken out and the topsoil has to be removed. Um, it's a small portion of the, 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 the mine portion is probably 15% of the total. And the reclamation portion, aside from the CO2 offsets and everything that's involved, we've pre-planted now already the first 20 plus years of, of operation. So those, those trees are currently growing as we're taking that 15 or 20. We're very sensitive about trees. Thank you. And my last one is just about noise because that was one of the concerns in the letters that have been written about this. So. Um, uh, is there going to be more noise than what's currently there with this expansion, or will the noise levels stay the same? It'll, it'll actually, for the receptors concerned about it, it will go down because the, the expansion is going into Kingston. As it goes into Kingston, it, first of all, it's going further away, and second, there's some very big walls of rock that are going to separate the equipment from the receptors, so the noise won't be open the way it has as we started the operation, it'll actually be significantly reduced, and that's what the noise studies all describe. Yes, Councillor Hiley. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, we learn something new, well, we learn multiple things new every day in this job, and this is uh, right up there. It's very fascinating, so thank you for taking the time to present as you have. Um, and it's also interesting to note that we have a competitive advantage in mining in Kingston, potentially. I wouldn't have thought that. Uh, but I do have a number of questions. Some of them are technical. Uh, one I want to start uh, that comes from my district, actually. I'm the representative for Trillium District, where if you know where the Rio can is, uh, that's kind of dead in the center. And right behind there, there's a whole bunch of development that's happening right now, which is really good uh, infilling with housing and apartment buildings. But part of that is blasting limestone. And I've had my inbox filled and my message on my phone filled with residents who are concerned about their property from the vibrations of the blasting of limestone, not so much the noise or the development activity in and of itself. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us about uh, um, the vibration that could impact the residential areas that were shown to be around the site. 
Chair, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I assume that the properties you're talking about are, are in fairly close proximity and comparative to what we're looking at in the, in the rural area. Um, however, a lot of the times when you're opening an excavation or if you're doing construction, you are concentrating your blast within the ground so that the energy is radiating out in all directions and it has a very, it's, it's able to move by bumping into its neighbors and, and waves of energy. What we're doing here is blasting off a face and there's an open face where we're blasting to. So the energy is easily transferred to the outside and you get a lot less shock waves and a lot less energy that's being able to move through uh, wave energy motion through the rock and, and having an impact on receptors. That being said, um, each blast that goes off, we're talking two or three a year, are monitored and are highly regulated. Um, and they're monitored with seismic uh, controls on site and around site between receptors so that we can identify if there is any concern. And if somebody does have a concern, they look at the, the blasting uh, contractor, will look at that information, determine if there was some reason, and if there is, they rectify the situation and change how they're doing it. Um, to date, there's been no, not even a uh, close um, reading that's been somewhat questionable even. But I, I understand the, the, the concerns that you have and the type of blasting that you're doing. When you're opening a mine, if you're opening a quarry, those first few blasts have the most amount of energy because they don't have anywhere to go. Thank you. And just to clarify, I think I heard what I was hoping for. There have been no uh, concerns with the, with the blasting from the neighbors. None that I know of. And we've had, uh, again, all, all blasting is done by professional contractors. And they've monitored them. And we haven't, uh, we even, we haven't even come close to the conservative studies that were really originally done. So it's, it's operating well within, well within margins. Very glad to hear that. Uh, next line of questioning is about the, the carbon impact of this material. And we heard that it's used for sequestration. I'm wondering about the carbon impact of actually the blasting and the mining operation itself. Perhaps um, to the, I, for, I get, forget your name, sir, I'm sorry. Rob, also Rob. Um, I'm wondering if the operation is carbon neutral. So the amount of carbon that goes into actually making it through the mining is offset by uh, the carbon that it sequesters once it's created. No idea. <laughs> um, the the amount of carbon sequestration is is massive. Um, we haven't actually done any uh, calculations on what it takes to operate a, a front end loader or a, a digger or whatever. Um, these are fairly, I would suggest, minor. But I have no idea what the actual numbers are. Okay. Thank you. Two more questions. Um, one was concerning. Uh, what was said to be the desktop error on behalf of the CRCA staff. Um, I'm wondering if that correspondence could be shared with the committee to consider when this comes before us again, uh, just to get an understanding of that environmentally sensitive piece that was in the proposed mining area. Mr. Chair, just to add some additional context, so when we were even preparing to file applications, how this had come up was we became, we started looking at, well, should we be getting an official plan amendment? Um, if this finger is sticking in there and now we're proposing to remove it, we need to assess it, see what's happening. Um, so that's sort of why we did a whole bunch of work before we even submitted the applications, and that's why there was so much um, back and forth uh, with CRCA staff as well as um, planning staff, and that's why... Um, Rob was heavily involved at, at that point. Um, but yes, I'm sure that correspondence can be can be made available and we do reference it um, in our planning report and um, which is available through Dash. But yes, additional information can certainly be provided. I appreciate both as a member of this committee and as a committee member for the Conservation Authority. And the final question has to do with uh, the archeological assessment by the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. I'm wondering if you know, perhaps not, and I can inquire elsewhere, does that study look at indigenous heritage? Does it look to um, First Nations archeology span that could be on a potential site that's under review? 
Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, you, I, I can barely pronounce that one because it's a tough one for me, but yes, it does. I, I looked through the, the standards for level one archeology span and it does incorporate um, beyond First Nation and also recent um, like pioneer settling uh, type, the, 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 all the cultural bases um, are covered off under, a, under that level one stage uh, screening process. Excellent, thank you yes. very much. No and Mr. Chappelle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Mine is more of a comment and also a question. Uh, I, first of all, I, I grew up in Sudbury around the mining sector. I sold mining equipment for a number of years. And uh, mining is probably the greatest economic impact for the size of topography you're dealing with. And uh, from what I saw in your presentation, I'd like to give you accolades for the amount of care that you're taking in making an ecologically viable project considering it. So thank you very much. I, I, it's a project that I can certainly say that I can be proud of as a Kingston councillor. I am very interested in knowing where that butternut tree is because I've never seen one. And I'd like to know if I can go on a, a walk about with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I, if you I take, take the chair, I recognize you. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. And this may be for staff. Um, th this is a very, very complex operation and something totally new for Kingston. So I'm just curious, um, would you, would staff feel that some kind of a peer review is in order or do, are you confident that the Cataraque Conservation Authority's involvement in the, in the process and the ministries in various ministries involvement allow us to feel confident in our due diligence uh, perhaps you could speak to that three mr. chair um, we're at the early stages of the technical review uh, certainly um, if our technical departments identify uh, a need for a peer review, that's something that's available to us to pursue through the official plan policies. Um, I'd also echo what you said in terms of the level of ministry oversight into this process as well. That will uh, continue beyond the Planning Act process. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, how. Uh, what's the level of employment that when, when the operation is kind of in full bloom, uh, what's the anticipated uh, employment? The, um, we outsource all of the contracting, all of the uh, mine contracting or quarry uh, operations to a local contractor, George Tackaberry and Sons. Um, they employ 250. I can't tell you roughly how much is on the site at any one time, but it supports uh, local employment and it supports uh, local truckers. It supports, um, it also supports uh, employment from some of our value added distributors in Toronto and Winnipeg and places like that. But locally it's, it's very significant. I use the, I use the, the over the lifespan at a hundred million dollars is very conservative in terms of local employment, local services. Thank you. And lastly, um, I, I'm really impressed with with uh, the presentation and how conscientious you are in the, in this endeavor. Um, I'll make an editorial comment. Canadian mining industry isn't always as consci conscientious conscientious as you seem to be so I appreciate that at at the end of the life of this mine uh, do you have uh, are you confident in having a full decommissioning uh, plan that will uh, leave this valuable piece of property uh, pristine or regain that aspect of it? Probably better than that. It'll, it'll be a very good source of food supply uh, locally to local markets and food distribution locally to local markets. It'll include greenhouses. We're selling into the greenhouse industry, um, rapidly increasing that. 
We're going to create a microhabitat that is going to be conducive to greenhouse operations, and that's the long-term plan for the, op or for the company. Thank you very much. Um, you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Seeing none, I will thank you for those answers, and we are now open for public present uh, questions or comments. Uh, just feel free to go to any microphone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm speaking from context of an interested citizen, but also as a retired geophysicist, so I have some technical insight into the project. Thank you very much for the presentations and uh, the thorough quoting of studies that you have referenced and to counsel for the questions so far. So I probably got about 15 minutes of questions. I know I'm not gonna get all of those in, but I'm gonna try to write up the ones I don't get in and put them on the record. So what I'm wondering is, in the township of Leeds and Thousand Islands, since the mine has begun, is there a reference to citizen feedback that's on the official record with that township governance that maybe the council could be aware of? Okay, um, question on the blasting. When you're blasting, are you blasting from underneath the surface or on the surface or both? Let me need some clarification on that. And what sort of dust are you creating and where is that going with the wind direction? Um, on one of the slides, you quoted the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change, which is a federal agency. And the provincial agency has changed its name from that. So you quoted mainly the provincial aspects. I didn't see any federal aspects. Are there any federal aspects to the operation? And maybe you could uh, explain more on that. Um, uh, again, uh, I think in the report, it's quoting a number of drawings by a group called Combien, or Combium. So those prepared by professional engineers and scientists. There's a lot of material there going on. Um, the question is, um, are there any other non-aggregate mining operations going on in the city of Kingston? I know we have some gravel pits, that kind of thing, and we have had for a very long time. But this is a new thing for Kingston. I think one of the councillors was hitting uh, on that. Is there potential for the city of Kingston to obtain any mining royalties from this operation? Or is the township of Leeds, Thousand Islands getting anything from that other than the tax from the building, the business operation? Um, are you expanding the mine into Kingston because you're running out in TLTI, or do you just want to expand it? Um, just curious on that. Um, now, looking at uh, page 88 in the package, you've got some, some pictures there and some chemical formula and some explanation. You're quoting the last tonight and the, the chemical symbol for it, and then underneath you had something called um, a, um, I can say, pronounced as diopside. So are you separating the lastonite from the diopside as part of the operation? Is that two distinct materials that are being produced there? Just remember, we have more information on that. It looks like a calcium, magnesium, silicate, uh, oxygen uh, compound. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to hit the next point. I'm probably going to be cut off here fairly soon, but it's going along with one of the questions already been raised. And... This is, is a lot going on here. I mean, no question about it, right? You're doing very interesting things and very good things from a lot of aspects. But the city, the city staff of Kingston have the specialized professional expertise available. 30, 30 seconds. Okay. Specialized professional expertise available to evaluate this project and this proposal from an arm's length basis, or do we have to look at maybe hiring somebody to do that task for the city and for council 
and for the citizens of Kingston. I think that's a very important uh, point. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. Um, I will say I'll answer one of those questions. Uh, royalties are the purview of, the, I believe, the federal and provincial government, and uh, all that we have for, uh, power over is property taxes. So, uh, so are there any other questions or comments from the public? Oh, thank you. You snuck up on me. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Doug Brooks. I own two properties on Burnt Hills Road uh, within stone's throw of the properties in question. Um, I apologize if I'm using the wrong terms. I'm new to this process. Um, I've been an owner of the property for eight years. It's been pretty quiet until recently, um, you know, literally and figuratively. Um, I guess I got a couple of, of comments. I'll, I guess there's a time limit, so I'll get to the two of them. Um, there was a picture up earlier, uh, an aerial view, and one of the councillors was asking, where is the direction of the ugliness going? And it was suggested that it's sort of on that picture up and to the left somewhat. So not towards the road, but sort of perhaps following that imperceptible hilltop. Um, I just like clarification that that is sort of what's happening, and I'll tell you why, because when I bought the property, it was October, and driving in the neighborhood, that hillside paralleling Highway 15 was ablaze in fall of colors, and that's one of the reasons why I purchased the property. In fact, that's why I thought it was called Burnt Hills Road, because the trees were alight with the fall of colors. It's probably just a myth, and I think it is a myth, but regardless. So it's one question is the scar that's visible in the middle of the picture, Will it be visible from Highway 15 or not? If it's, if it's another side of the hill, I've got less of a problem because I don't see it because I'm on Burnt Hills Road. Um, other people may have problems because, you know, on the other side of the hill, on, on Seabrook Road perhaps, different issue. But from my perspective, if it's, it's a visual scar, am I going to see it or not? Um, so that's sort of one point. Next point, the remediation. Someone was talking about um, remediating it to greenhouses. Um, I believe, um, Robert, you talked remediation as being a hill, the hillock, the berm. Um, so essentially putting a fence around the scar as opposed to reseeding, resoiling. And then you said another point that there was trees being planted, so I'm unclear as to this 15 meter per year scar, will it be permanent or will it be a cliffside or will it be eventually returned to greenery? Um, whenever I hear, moving on to the next point, whenever I hear of mines and I hear open pit mines, I don't think I want to live next to them. Um, I will say, um, Robert, you've, so far you've been a pretty good neighbor. You put up that anuk shuk, uh, if that's the right word. You didn't have to do that. It's actually a, tour, a miniature tourist attraction. Um, you put out a little bin for help yourself to Wollastonite stuff recently in a year or two. Um, you didn't have to do that. Uh, you've, been, you've been pushing this pier on the table for six years, I gather, so good on you. Um, I'm extremely new to this process. In fact, this is my first time in the building, so good for you. Um, uh, in terms of the economics, um, $100 million, I guess that's over 50 years. So that's $2 million per year. So, and that's certainly more than my small business farming on Burnt Hills Road, but that's sort of, I think an annual revenue impact is a, a valuable, point, valuable item to put into the record. Um, to, to the expansion, and I'll try and get to wrap up here. Um, in the last year or two, I've been noticing, I guess, the Tackleberry trucks on Highway 15, making the turn on the dedicated lane into your property, and that's great. Um, I guess one question I have is how many more of those trucks, and those are the large double axled, if that's the right word, trucks, how many more of those will be on the highway going forward? Um, and is, just to clarify, is there only gonna be two or three blasts per year? I can be working in my field and I'll feel and hear it 
Um, so it's, it's, I don't know how far away I am, 500 meters, sort of hard to tell, but it is, it's not life turning over, but you do notice it. So this two or three year, that's in my, uh, from my perspective, that's no big deal. It's country living, you know, tractors going by make more noise than that on a regular basis. And, the, and our blessed tourists make more noise than that going over the Rideau. So um, it's all in perspective. Um, the, and I will say that the blasts have been occurring during the day, so it's not upsetting nighttime. And I don't think you blast on the weekends, but I'm not sure what your plans are. Um, if you're sticking to the 7 to 7 daytime, Monday to Friday, that's great. Um, and that would be acceptable for my, for my two cents. Um, there wasn't any indication as to the seasonality of your business, if it's you know, $2 million a year, evenly over 12 months, or if it's high summer activity or low, you know, or high winter activity or to that end, that might be valuable to know for the neighbors. Um, and wrapping up, the, the document, I'm not sure what you guys call these things, the path or the, the dash things, talked about additional buildings. And I gather it's sort of in and around the existing gray area um, again, sort of in a not in my backyard. If you're putting the buildings towards 15 and more visible, that would be a concern to me. If it's over the hill and on the backside, I'm not as you know <laughs> impacted. And I don't, you know, good for you. Um, thank you, for Mr. Chairman, and everybody. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the public? See, seeing none, uh, if you would like to address some of those questions or if staff would, that would be great. Hopefully this will address some of the questions. Most of them aren't really directed in my direction, but I, I hope this will help. Where do I press this thing? <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, this land off to the side here, uh, that we last night uh, have bought. It's a farm with a mix of a field and a few forests. Um, if there's further, sorry, when further tree compensation is done, it'll be done, most likely done there. Um, this. All right. This area here is part of the Leeds uh, mine, and if it looks a little different right there, it's because it's all scrub habitat, it's not forest. Um, that little scar there is an existing uh, sort of road system, so the mine will follow that road and it'll curve around, again, on another existing road system, it'll center on that. Um, the actual amount of forest that will actually, like existing forest that will need to be cleared uh, we don't know exactly, but it's in the estimate about 15 hectares. Um, there's easily 15 hectares of land here to replace that. Um, this wall here uh, will ma be maintained so you won't see the mine activity from Highway 15 uh, throughout its production and when it's done. This, this wall will always be here. Uh, new buildings um, are currently proposed on the lead side roughly there and they'll be mostly at a site of Highway 15 as well, again, by the wall, by this bit of vegetation here. If you do a quick glance down here, you might catch it, but this existing structure will be blocking that building anyway. It won't be, won't be a particularly huge building anyway. I'll maybe just quickly speak to the one or two kind of more planning related ones and then I'll leave it to Bob and Mike to fight it out for the rest. Um, uh, Mr. Dixon had made a comment about getting official correspondence from what had happened in TLTI. Um, any correspondence related to any Planning Act applications um, are a matter of public record there. Um, we can see about facilitating um, getting those um, transferred to City of Kingston staff if, if there was a desire for that. Um, as I mentioned, it was the subject of an OMB appeal. Um, the original approval is back in 20, 2012, and that's, again, publicly, um, the decision and materials related to that publicly available. Um, 
I think there was also a question about other mining operations in, in Kingston, and while there are other um, quarrying operations regulated under the Aggregate Resources Act, um, my understanding is this is actually one of the only um, mining operations this, this, in this part of on Ontario as a whole. Um, most, as mentioned by um, Councillor Chappelle, are, are much further north. Um, in terms of, there was a comment again, um, which again, Councillor Neal had also expressed about getting possibly the need for peer reviews, um, just to sort of add on to what Lindsay had said. Um, again, because we also go through this Mining Act approvals process, everything is being reviewed by um, the ministries and there is that level of review. Um, a number of the studies are also, um, were completed for the original um, site in TLTI. Um, and have been updated and, and considered the whole area and they were subject to um, extensive review through that OMB appeal process. So um, we will be, we're actually meeting with staff tomorrow to, to review the technical comments and we will be working through that technical process. Um, but there are those sort of other review agencies um, for everyone to consider. Um, I think that's probably all for me. Maybe I'll shift, shift over to Mike and Bob and see what they, what they can do. Okay, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the blasting at present is uh, full depth to pit floor, um, so you can see where the where the current face is now. Um, it will continue upwards to uh, roughly 20 meters in the in the center area, um, and that'll be one one blast, no benching required, no benching in that aspect. The dust is controlled um, as per the ECA uh, for the current mine. Which uh, includes monitoring of that of the of the dust during blasts and through operation and crushing. The uh, federal aspects. Um, I apologize. The ministry did change its acronym from MOECC to MECP um, since the uh, Ford uh, government came into power. Um, the federal aspects uh, of mining are generally related to the. Uh, metal mining effluent, and it's usually, uh, sorry, it is um, a, a legislation under the um, Federal Environmental Act, and it is uh, not uh, applicable here because it's not considered a metal mine, um, and that's under the Fisheries Act, metal mine effluent regulation, which would be under the Fisheries Act. So to answer that short question, no, the federal aspects uh, are not uh, important here in terms of uh, from the mining perspective, although they are from some degree from Rob's in terms of the uh, federal species at risk. Uh, the drawings that were provided by Cambium and by BGC and by other uh, consultants that prepared the documentation, the technical studies that have been submitted to the city in support of the application um, are all stamped uh, by uh, either professional engineers or professional geoscientists or uh, architects and uh, biologists. Um, as per the regulation requires and as per the review agency's recommendations and requirements. Uh, mining royalties were taken care of. Um, there are financial assurances that it will be posted um, to the, the province um, in various forms, which will allow the province to um, undertake rehabilitation pro practices, re 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 remediation and rehabilitation uh, post-closure or during any state of inactivity if the proponent fails to do so. So those, those as a, uh, you may be aware of the royalties that go into uh, the rehabilitation uh, torque for aggregate operations um, where they pay a, a royalty per tonnage. Um, this is paid 100% upfront uh, in one form or another, whether it be bonds or letter of credit, uh, et cetera, to cover those costs. Uh, that's under the Mining Act and it's a, it's a requirement it's, um, known as financial assurances. Uh, the reason for expanding is just to complete the permitting process. Uh, as Bob alluded to earlier, it's uh, took 1.2 billion years to, to create this material, uh, about a third of the life uh, span of the earth, and it takes about a third of the lifespan of Bob to uh, get this process permitted, so that's why we're going through the process at this point. <laughs> Sorry. The separation process of dioxide and last night at, this pre at the present time, the material is shipped as one. Uh, there will be uh, separation processes, physical separation processes um, that will be employed to, to refine the, product, the product. Um, but at this time, they're shipped as one. And as the uh, ore body is followed, they can be separated to, to, to some degree um, just through ore selection and, and, and uh, control from, from uh, blasting and removal. Um, 
you touched on the tree screen from the visibility from Highway 15. All right, thanks, Rob. Um, will transportation increase going forward? Uh, not substantially. There'll definitely be the transportation will remain within the uh, approved limits that um, were provided through the studies that were originally done to show whether or not there'd be an impact to traffic on Highway, Highway 15. Um, but of course, as, as markets um, ebb and flow, there will be some increases uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but again, maintaining them within that uh, the requirement, uh, which is based on the tonnage and the actual lifespan of the mine. Uh, the blastings do not expect to be any more than two or three times per year. Um, the blasting at the present time uh, is, is trying to shape a face that, that creates a workable space. Um, so the, the frequency of blasts in the beginning of a mine are, are, are usually smaller but more frequent because you're trying to develop a nice workable face, flat area where you can fold the face off and excavate. Once that's established, that uh, two or three it will, will be more, um, it'll, be, it'll be more uh, consistent frequency, if you will. The uh, processing of the material in terms of seasonality, um, our process between um, spring and fall, um, and again, that, that goes down to sort of the, uh, uh, the ease of, of processing, uh, temperatures, um, the tree coverage for, for noise uh, mitigation and everything else. Um, but shipping will, will continue throughout the year um, as market demands. The uh, buildings that were identified on the site plan earlier um, are remain in the TLTI site. And if you look at the drawing, they're sort of to the, if, if you're looking at the drawing, you're looking, I believe, west here. Um, so those ponds, or those two skinny ponds that are oriented um, east-west um, to the left or to the south would be where those two, two buildings would be. And they'd be similar to the white building that you can see in the bottom right corner of the disturbed area. Um, I don't know if I missed anything. Anything to add? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, We'll go, we'll go back uh, into the committee then if there are any further comments or questions. I have one or two minor ones, but. I take the chair and recognize you. Thank you. I don't know why that made him. <laughs> um, I, I have heard the concern from one of your near neighbors regarding uh, uh, the two or three times a year you anticipate blasting. Um, as a courtesy, will you let your immediate neighbors know that next Tuesday is a blasting day between noon and four o'clock or whatever? We always do. So we do, we do serve notice ahead of every blast. Uh, we try to give as much notice as we can. We narrow it down to the day, and then within the day, we narrow it down to as, as close as we can to within what hours it would likely be detonated. Good, I appreciate that. And a quick question for staff. Um, so it's anticipated over the next 40 or 50 years, not that we'll be here, but uh, there'll be uh, anticipated buildings uh, that will be required. They'll go through, uh, I mean, all we're doing is changing the zoning. So they'll come uh, through the planning process again and possibly not coming here if it meets the, um, the zoning requirements at the time. Is, is that an accurate assumption? Three, Mr. Chair, I think the submitted application contemplates the possibility of, of buildings and uh, proposes uh, yard standards for those buildings. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, if I can just add a yes. little bit to that. Um, at this point in time, we don't anticipate any buildings within the city lands. Uh, the building structures will be in Leeds and Thousand Islands, and the excavation will pursue into the city lands. Thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you very much for a very thorough education. Uh, I appreciate it. So that will be the last of, oh, we have one more public meeting. And that's uh, 480 and 482 Albert Street.
Willis and Houston, the two, and then Willis over the last one. He's got uh, Anne-Marie sent. So if you want to run yours, that could be fun. But maybe she sent one for uh, the comprehensive and comprehensive. Okay. So fair enough. Please. All right. Four Thanks, times or less. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just give it a moment to settle down. All right, all right. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of planning committee, staff and members of the public. My name is Yuko LeClaire. I'm a land use planner with FOTEN Consultants and it's my pleasure to present an application for zoning bylaw amendment at 480 and 482 Albert Street on behalf of uh, Mr. Paul Gausel. Uh, the application, or the subject site is located in central Kingston. It's just south of the intersection of Albert Street and uh, Princess Street. It's just at the edge of the Main Street commercial corridor there. Um, so to the lands to the north and east are commercial, and then to the south and, the, and west, the lands are residential. It's in an area that has excellent access to community parks. There's the Memorial Center to the north, Victoria Park and Churchill Park, which are all very different types of, of programmed uh, community spaces. It's an area that has excellent transit access. The express bus route runs along Princess Street, uh, as well as regular bus routes. That's the closest, but there's also bus routes along Brock and Johnson Street to the south. Uh, it's a walkable community. There's sidewalks on both sides of the road. There's bus lanes on Princess Street. It is a, an area that the official plan would identify as, as well suited to intensification. Zeroing in a little bit on the subject site, you can see the proximity to the nearest express bus stops. They're about 100 feet away. Um, and you can also see from this aerial image that the site is currently developed. There is a semi-detached dwelling on the property, uh, and there's also a detached garage. Uh, I note that there's two driveways and walkways, but you can see that much more clearly looking at the site from the street. So when you're looking at the property, uh, the right-hand side, the brick dwelling, that's a two and a half story. That was originally a, a single detached dwelling. That was the original house on the property. Uh, the driveway that's just to the right of that dwelling uh, leads to that detached garage. Uh, and there's no physical changes proposed whatsoever to that side of the site. That's, that's an existing unit that'll remain. Uh, to the left, uh, that brown-sided uh, addition, that was constructed as an addition which converted the, the unit to a, a semi-detached dwelling. Uh, and you can see that that's st stepped back quite a bit from the, uh, the front face of the brick house, and that's because it was built much later. It was built within the last 10 years uh, in compliance with zoning. So that's why that setback is quite a bit sig more significant there. It's a lower building, it's only two stories. Um, and there is a separate driveway for that unit as well along the left-hand side, which is to the south. Uh, the reason for the application this evening is, is primarily just to allow a secondary suite within that addition, that, that, that left-hand addition on the south side of the building. Um, the, it's also to facilitate a future severance along the common party line, which will allow the existing lot to be divided into two. So it's very much a, a straightforward secondary suite uh, and, and future severance. Um, the secondary suite that's proposed uh, will have access, uh, access from an existing rear entrance, which is below grade. Uh, it'll also have a new front entrance that, that'll be constructed below grade uh, from Albert Street to provide a, a direct street facing access. Um, and it'll also have a new uh, a dedicated parking space. So right now the zoning requirement for that unit is just one parking space. By adding a secondary suite, the parking requirement doubles. Uh, so the existing driveway would be extended towards the rear of the house and then two parking spaces would be uh, developed there. I'll note that the only exterior addition is that new front entrance at the, at the below grade for the secondary suite. Um, just showing the layout of the proposed secondary suite in the basement. Uh, so it would be a three bedroom uh, layout. The city has guidelines for secondary suites which restrict them to 40% of the gross floor area of a residential unit uh, or 90 square meters, whichever is less. In this particular case, uh, that 90 square meters is gonna be the, the more restricting factor. Uh, and these restrictions, these, these limitations for secondary suites will be reflected in the draft zoning bylaw amendment uh, that's in the package tonight. Uh, this slide is really just showing the proposed severance, the lot line that'll, that'll divide the property into two. Uh, and in order to achieve this vision, this secondary suite and the severance, 
the applicant is required uh, to submit the zoning bylaw amendment application, which is what we're presenting tonight. And then in the future, after council makes a decision on the zoning, an application for consent to sever the lot will be submitted. Normally, when we review a zoning bylaw amendment application, we'll go through the PPS and the official and the official plan of the city. Those are the two sort of primary policy documents that regulate development in Kingston. Uh, in this case, the policy, the provincial policy statement direction is, is very clear when you're dealing with um, intensification. It, it supports intensification, it supports secondary suites, it supports maximizing your use of existing infrastructure. Uh, and that's, in this case, that's, that's what's being proposed. There is new infrastructure here which will be better utilized by adding another unit uh, within the existing building. There's no, no new construction proposed uh, on, on the site. From an official plan perspective, uh, the policy direction is very similar. Uh, it's, it, the land is designated for residential use, which supports intensification, supports secondary suites, it supports uh, compatibility of built form, and in this case, the built form is not substantially gonna change. Um, why are we uh, seeking a zoning bylaw amendment? Well, the current zoning is that one and two family dwelling zone, the A zone in, in the city of Kingston zoning bylaw, which only allows two dwelling, up to two dwelling units. It also doesn't allow secondary suites if you already have a two dwelling unit building. So uh, in order to allow a secondary suite and introduce that use, we have to go through a zoning bylaw amendment process to, to add that. So the proposed zoning uh, amendment will, will do exactly that. It'll, it'll introduce a secondary suite as a permitted use. It'll define both the secondary suite and the principal dwelling unit as a result. It'll also describe some standards for the secondary suite. So that includes those limitations on, on GFA and, and in terms of a, as a ratio of the residential floor area as well as a maximum uh, for the unit itself. It'll describe a standards for access. There's a minimum parking requirement of one parking space uh, access to the front lot line. So those types of things are, are defined in the zoning bylaw amendment. Um, and then uh, other than that, the, the zoning bylaw amendment is really just capturing the existing built form. Uh, so the existing built form, particularly that old brick house, was built well before the zoning bylaw existed. Uh, so it doesn't comply with some, some setbacks. It's, for example, it, there's a zero front yard setback. So those types of, of, of considerations will be captured by the zoning bylaw amendment. The projections, the steps that project out from the front of the buildings. Um, the parking area, the, the zoning bylaw allows a, a maximum parking area, which is reflective of basically two parking spaces. In this case, by adding a third parking space, we need to for, seek relief for the, for, for the parking area to allow that um, side yard setback for the accessory structure. So that garage is, is about a foot from the property line. There is a fence there, um, and it's, it's not causing any adverse effects on the neighboring property. Uh, and none of these performance standards are, and that's why we're, we're asking for them to be approved um, so that more or less wraps up my presentation. Uh, it's, this is a zoning bylaw amendment to allow a secondary suite in the existing built form to facilitate that future severance of the property. Um, it achieves intensification in a way that's compatible. It, it fits within the neighborhood. It fits within the existing building. Um, it contributes to the supply and affordability of housing in the city. Um, it's consistent with the provincial policy statement and with the official plan. And I will also note that um, in the agenda for this evening, this recommendation, this Application is being brought forward for a recommendation for approval. Um, and we've read through staff's report and read through the zoning bylaw. Staff have worked very closely with us to develop zoning that describes the site and addresses all of the performance standards that need to be met. Uh, and we agree with staff's recommendation and welcome any questions or comments from the committee and the public. Thank you very much. I'll turn to uh, the appropriate. Good evening through you, uh, Mr. Chair. In accordance with the Planning Act, a notice for public meeting was provided in the form of a sign posted on the subject property 20 days in advance of the public meeting. In addition, notices were sent by mail to 109 property owners, and a courtesy notice uh, was placed in the newspaper. No correspondence has been received. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I will turn to the committee. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, going back to the floor plan of the proposed secondary suite, uh, I just want to make sure that I'm seeing this right. There is an, a rear exit on the hall. That, That's correct. Okay, good. I just wanted to ensure that because I saw that the kitchen was at the front door and if there's a stove fire and I couldn't get out easily, I didn't know where I'd be able to do that, but through the back door. That's good. Uh, second question is for staff. Uh, I understand that there 
our new policies coming forward on secondary suites. And because this is also before us tonight for approval, if they were to um, be changed, if the recommendations that you'll bring to us are adopted, that they wouldn't affect this proposal. Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so approving this application tonight will live with this property despite the amendments that we make through the second residential units. Obviously before you tonight, we've provided a combined report recognizing that um, the policy direction that we're going forward is to allow these units as of right in the future. So uh, we wanted to ensure that um, we're appropriately reviewing the standards, but at the same time, it is a concept that we're very supportive of to the, to the point that we are going to be allowing them as a right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Just for the line of the layout, I'm targeted towards student housing. Yeah, and through application, we can't really speak to is the targeted demographic. Um, I think Realistically, given the site's location, that it's very likely that students will be the, the primary tenants of, of, the, of the property. Any further questions, comments? Seeing uh, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, just a question to staff. Um, this fits within the A zone requirement, right? And so there's no movement to a B here. Is that impression correct? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the existing semi-detached house is certainly a permitted use within the A zone. Um, right now, the A zone doesn't specifically permit second residential units. So through this application, we're proposing to permit that within the A zone. Um, obviously, through our future amendments, uh, with the second residential unit policies, we would be proposing to allow them as of right within the A zone. So they, the semi-detached is a permitted use, but it's the addition of the second residential unit that requires an amendment to the A zone. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, perhaps one other question. Oh, just a question to the um, representative of the proponent. Um, you're going to, um, Sever and sever these properties when you're done, correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. And why is that? Um, I think primarily it, it provides a little bit more flexibility and ownership. So right now, if to acquire this property by semi-detached and two two units, so by severing the lot, it provides it increases the affordability of the lot of the each unit within the semi-detached dwelling, uh, and then that se that secondary suite within the one side increases the affordability of that unit further should a family choose to move in, for example, and rent out the basement suite. Thank you. Thank you. No further questions from the committee. Um, are there any members of the public who would like to speak to this? Seeing none, um, I'll call this, uh, oh, and I assume there's no further questions or comments, so I will call this public meeting and all the public meetings to an end. So we'll move into our regular planning committee meeting, uh, and I'll call that meeting to order. A motion to approve the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Sanek. Councillor Hill. Oh, there is an addendum. So, approval of the agenda with the addendum. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Osanek, Councillor Hill. Uh, confirmation of minutes from our February 7th meeting. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of approval of the agenda? Passed. Uh, confirmation of meeting of minutes uh, with mover and a sec seconder. Okay, Councillor Hill, Councillor Asanic, they're the quick hands. Okay, all those in favor? Carried. Uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest. I indeed have a pecuniary interest. 
Uh, I, Jim Neal of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of item C to do with 70 Barbara Avenue since I own a, an adjoining property. So, uh, we have no delegations, we have no briefings. Uh, we do have some three business items. Uh, this portion of the meeting is open to the public. The city has initiated a new process in which members of the public will have the opportunity to speak for up to five minutes on comprehensive reports presented before the planning committee. Those wishing to provide oral comments at this meeting will be invited to do so. If a person or public body would otherwise have an ability to appeal the decision of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston to the local planning appeal tribunal, but the person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kingston before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. And our first uh, item tonight is uh, 480, 482 Albert Street. Uh, and that's uh, before us with a recommendation. Um, that it be recommended to council that the application for zoning bylaw amendment submitted by FOTAN on behalf of Paul Goswell and for the property municipally known as 480, 482 be approved, Albert be approved. Uh, and that we recommend that the, this be presented to council for all three readings. Is there any comments or questions? That's the public meeting we just heard. Is there a mover and a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Chappelle, Councillor Hill. Uh, seeing no further questions or comments, all those in favor? Carried. Our next one is regarding the 130, 152 Greenlease Avenue. Uh, and the recommendation uh, for a zoning bylaw amendment is before us. Is there a mover and a seconder for that? Yes, Councillor Osanek, Councillor Hill. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none? Oh, sorry, Councillor Osanek. Through you, Chair, I just want to clarify that they are going to be um, single lot homes, right? Because we had a letter today and it seemed like the, or maybe it was a couple of people, they just seemed confused. And um, although the letters could have been from the public meeting, because I know there was a lot of confusion at the public meeting and then the developer was here and totally clarified it. So it is still going to be single lot homes. Mr. Chair, the on the property, so the lots are existing lots of record and the zoning on the properties allow single family and semi-detached dwellings um, to be uh, permitted use. However, uh, we understand through discuss this discussions with the developer that the, uh, the intent is to build uh, single detached dwellings um, consistent with the, with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, and I also understand that the servicing that's kept at the property line is also for single detached dwellings. Thank you. Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, member of the public. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just want to put one question on the record. Are there any further planning steps required on this project before its actual construction could begin? And if not, could the developer provide clarity on the date of the intent to start construction? Thank you. 
To you, Mr. Chair, developer is not here tonight. Um, I understand that building permits have been pulled few of the of the lots already um, in terms of what's permitted through the existing zoning. So construction, uh, my understanding is that construction is uh, either ongoing or very close to um, start, um, and the developer intends to build most of, build and sell most of these lots um, within the year. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I will call the question since we've moved and seconded it already. All those in favor? Carried. And I will now pass the chair over to the vice chair and I'm going to I'm going to head to Dublin. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Jason Sands. I'm a senior planner with the city of Kingston. Uh, thank you for sticking around to the uh, to the end. Um, we have. Uh, I'm here to speak to you tonight about 70 Barbara Avenue, um, and sort of discuss uh, the chronology as it relates to this project, um, which is started in 2016 and probably earlier on than that uh, for the applicant himself. But uh, specifically in front of us today is the site plan control application um, that was requested to be bumped up to planning committee through the processing of the zoning bylaw amendment application. Um, so dating back to 2016, the city received applications for consent and for zoning bylaw amendment. Um, and the zoning bylaw amendment has been processed and completed to date. That zoning bylaw amendment created two site-specific zones on the property known as 70 Barbara Avenue and created some performance standards, which I've highlighted here on the screen, to permit stacked townhomes as a built form a two and a half story max height, 116 dwelling units, land division contemplated into two separate parcels, um, a bicycle and a parking uh, space requirement on site uh, at, a, at the ratio of one to one, as well as specifics including landscaping, fencing, and some materiality built right into the site specific zoning. Um, as I mentioned earlier, back through the processing of that file, it was at that time in which um, it was requested that the subsequent site plan control applications be bumped up for additional public interest. Um, I've, again, I've spoke to this a little bit already, but the chronology uh, started with the zoning bylaw amendment and a consent application. The consent and the zoning bylaws were, were both submitted and received in 2016. The zoning bylaw amendment, as mentioned, has been approved. Um, the consent has not. The severance, consent severance, uh, is held, has been held in, in abeyance, essentially um, because there is no municipal, there's no road frontage on a municipal street for the southernmost portion of that parcel. Um, so the 0.7 acre component of the site along the north has frontage onto Barbara Avenue and the 3.6 acre site uh, or portion of the site on the southern half uh, has frontage on what's called Frey Street. Frey Street does not exist as of yet and the applicant will be required to construct that to municipal specifications, convey that to the municipality to establish the frontage. We have a site plan application at D110252013 that I've titled Frey Street Construction. It's essentially a shell site plan agreement that has been worked on in, in harmony with our engineering group to, to be the catalyst for 
a off-site works agreement to facilitate the construction of Frey Street. That agreement has been completed. It is, it is finalized and with the applicant. However, the desire of the applicant is to have the on-site development and the nuances associated with the actual development worked out and understood before the construction of the street proceeds. So that takes us to the file that we have in front of you tonight, D110322017, the active site plan control application that is the catalyst to move us into permitting the 116 units of stacked townhomes on the entirety of the property. <clears throat> Just a, an, an aerial photo to show the context as to where we are in the city. You'll see um, the major arterial division street running north-south, Barbara Avenue um, going east-west across the top, and the site in the middle in a very irregular shaped parcel with uh, a long, narrow um, portion of land that's also complicated as it relates to topography. The north end on Barbara Avenue is relatively high and the, and the frontage down on the south end on that unopened road allowance right now is relatively low. As you can see in this photo, there's a significant amount of vegetation and trees on the site as this property has not been developed previously. It's been vacant um, for some time or forever, I, I suppose. Um, so there, there is some su substantial vegetation. Through the processing of the zoning bylaw amendment application and the public process that accompanied that, that uh, file, there was a lot of input received related to the trees um, and what level uh, of requirement and rigor was built into the city requirement um, for maintaining those trees uh, and how many would be reinstated, how the landscaping plans would look and function um, for the site plan applications. So I wanted to make sure that this was included in tonight's presentation. As identified in the City of Kingston official plan, the parcel is denoted as being a contributory woodland. Um, we have two classifications in the official plan, a contributory woodland and a significant woodland. This is a contributory woodland. With that, there was a tree permit that was submitted and obtained um, and completed by city staff, forestry staff specifically, for the removal of 50 trees on the property, and they were primarily in the southern portion of the parcel. <clears throat> to compensate for the 50 trees that were removed on site, the applicant was required to provide the city $18,550, which would be utilized for general reforestation for trees in and amongst the city. It is, um, common practice for the forestry group to complete the planting and the reforestation in close proximity as, as possible to the area that the trees were removed off-site on public land. Um, so that is an op opportunity that does exist in the King's Court neighborhood, um, but it's not necessarily a requirement based on the bylaws um, that are at hand, so that is in the hands of our forestry staff um, for, the, for their uh, future works. And I just wanted to confirm here, uh, there has been on-site inspections post the issuance of that tree permit through forestry staff to confirm the number of trees as specified on the tree inventory, the tree preservation plans um, to be removed were in fact the ones that were removed. <clears throat> so just a little bit um, into the details of what we're talking about tonight and, and, and how that relates to site plan control. Site plan control, you've heard a lot tonight about zoning bylaw amendments, and I think there were some draft plan of condos or subdivisions discussed, but site plan control is a much more refined process in which staff get into the technical detail and the technical merit of reviewing the on-site functionality, the layout, 
parking, number of spaces, accessible, accessibility, um, the landscaping, stormwater management practices, all of those on-site um, details are what's the focus, the primary focus of a site plan control application. <clears throat> the built form, the height, the density, that's more of a discussion for zoning and official plan amendments in which have already been established in this case. This is a snapshot of, our, of the zoning that is applicable to the property to date. You'll see the northern portion of the parcel has got a B2 509 site-specific zone that applies to it. The specifics of that zone permit 16 units in total in the form of one townhome. Um, the requirements, as I mentioned earlier, are that there's one par parking space, bicycle parking space units, and it's all specified in that zone. The B2510-H zone is on the southern, we're calling the retained parcel, which is the larger parcel, which has permissions built in to permit the development of 100 dwelling units on that area of the lot. Two things I wanna point out. The zoning has been structured into two zones to correlate with the consent or the severance application that the city has received to date. Um, once the severance is finalized, each respective parcel would have its own unique zone. The second point I wanna mention is that dash H zone on the southern parcel. It's a holding symbol. <clears throat> and there's a holding symbol that applies to it for two reasons, um, but primarily for the frontage component. So technically today there's zero road frontage for that parcel and that's why the severance is sitting in abeyance. Um, and that's also why the city would neglect any ability for the developer to proceed in the construction of, of residential units on that portion of the property. So the holding symbol may not be removed until the successful completion, conveyance um, to the municipality of Frey Street. Once that occurs, the applicant would then submit an H-lift application to the municipality before ever receiving a building permit. <clears throat> this is the overall site plan drawing. I know it's very difficult to see, so I've tried to put a link into your agenda package, which is 100 page 180 um, for you. And it uh, gets into uh, uh, the finer details of the layout of the internal connectivity from a pedestrian and a vehicular routing um, from the layout of the buildings, as well as the parking areas. I've zoomed in on a couple on the, both the southern portion and the northern portion. So on this slide, I'll focus on the southern. And this bulb end or cul-de-sac you typically see in a suburban setting is what we're considering when we say Frey Street that the applicant would then be required to construct and convey. That would establish our frontage or the frontage for the southern portion of the lot. This row, uh, which is staggered, is, uh, is the, are the dwelling units. So one block, two block, three block, four block, continuing on, each of which range from 16 to 20 units within. In front of uh, each of those is the parking area and the landscaped open space, amenity space, play space, um, for residents is all in behind where it's sheltered um, and more safe from a vehicular separation point of view. This area here on the um, screen, I don't know if you can see that, um, this is a parquet that the applicant is proposing as part of the overall, as part of the overall development, which would have direct frontage and connectivity out to the municipal road. We, we short form this to POPs, private, public, open space um, through the development process so that the applicant would provide an easement where this land may be utilized by any of the neighboring uh, residents and not solely for the purposes of the development itself. This portion in the southeastern extent of the lot is a very steep uh, area of grade change 
and it has been um, designed to accommodate the stormwater management that's necessary to ensure that the, pre that the post development flows do not exceed the pre. Just moving along, continuing on that site plan drawing on the northern portion of the site, you can see this, the retained parcel continues on in the same form of development with the stacked townhomes in their block forms and the internal road connectivity through the site, which will be private. The only public road is the Frey Street stub with the ball bend. Um, will carry through the site and establish a grid-like pattern similar to the Kings Court neighborhood. The severed parcel that's in the top half or top portion of the site, which I referred to earlier as the portion of the lot that does not have a holding symbol, contains 16 dwelling units in total in this area, is screened with buffering from Barbara Avenue itself, uh, <clears throat> and is also subject to this site plan control application, even though it's on a separate, future separate parcel. I just want to relate it back, site plan control and how, and it relate it back to our official plan and specifically 9532 of the plan, which gets us into our detail as to what planning staff and members of the public can expect or looked at when confronting the details of the technical merit in a site plan application. So as it relates specifically to this project, the development is to develop an underutilized uh, and, and often exploited, from what I understand through the owner himself, uh, vacant property. As I mentioned, there's the uh, creation of a public road on the southern end, and there's a, and there's a creation of a private road internal connection north-south, uh, which would connect two public roads and give us the grid-like connectivity and the permeability through the site to, which is in, in line with SEPTED principles um, for safety. Compatible in terms of scale and massing, the built form is somewhat unique to Kingston in that it's stacked townhomes. We actually, through the zoning bylaw amendment, introduced it as a new use and a new definition because it's not one that existed. Um, however, the bylaw also refined its max height its scale to be two and a half stories, which is in keeping with the neighboring single family dwellings uh, and the other residential uses in the near area. Um, I've already addressed and explained the connectivity from, an excess, from a, from a uh, pedestrian and a vehicular point of view. I've alluded to the park component that we're working on, with actively working on with the applicant uh, and the stormwater management uh, storm scepter system in that south corner. This is an, e an exterior elevation um, of one of the units or of one of the blocks, I should say, all seven blocks look very similar in massing. Um, and this is the, the exterior elevation. This is more of a facade rendering to illustrate what the, the, the blocks would look like and give us a sense to what a stacked townhome form would be. So um, basically the upper units would be two stories in height uh, and accessed up the stairs and in. The lower unit is a smaller unit accessed by going down a few stairs into the lower unit. I have the floor plans on the next slides. So the basement plan here illustrates how it can effectively accommodate a one bedroom unit in the basement by using the stairwell. The ground floor unit uh, and the upper story unit are, are uh, slightly larger <clears throat> and would accommodate three, sorry, two bedrooms uh, and a bath on that second floor. So through site plan control, as mentioned, it's a very technical exercise and, and internally and externally we circulate to applicable agencies and these are the specific agencies and commentary that are outstanding to date. The, it, it's important to note that it's a 2017 file. The applicant has been working with the city through refinements of the plan and, and narrowing down the outstanding issues to circulations. Um, we've anticipated or we will be receiving a third very, very shortly. Um, and these are the comments that uh, will be addressed. So 
traffic lights, need some more detail as it relates to the construction of Frey Street, parks development, really working on refining that public-private open space and the easement, uh, and a market appraiser to come up with how that's going to roll into the cash in lieu component that's required. Um, the, the fire uh, review is something that's uh, in, in, with respect to the fire code and the Ontario Building Code um, that is being, being examined. And solid waste has commentary as it relates to a central collection point just because of the volume and the density that is anticipated from the property. Um, the planning department has two concerns outstanding at the time and it relates to granted that the applicant wishes to proceed with a central collection point for garbage enclosures that would be considered an accessory structure. We need to understand where that's going, not impacting parking, pedestrian connectivity, consistent with the uh, site-specific zoning, et cetera, as well as the bicycle parking. So the bylaw requires one-to-one, -one, and we want to ensure through this process that that can act fully be accommodated on site if it's in a unit or if it's in a separate structure, and if it's in a unit, how it'll be accessed because it's acknowledged that there's stairs to go in each of the two units that are proposed in the stacked configuration. Um, I, so it, with, with that in your report, the recommendation that has been uh, included is, uh, is as follows on the screen in that uh, staff wish to have the application referred back to the delegated authority of the Director of Planning, Building and Licensing uh, and that staff continue to proceed with the conversation of the outstanding technical merits with the applicant, continue into entering into a site plan control agreement to define all of those studies, requirements, plans, register it on title, as well as submitting any financial securities that will be needed to secure the on and off site works. If you have any questions, I hope I can address them. Excellent. Just before we take questions, could staff quickly clarify the difference between this type of approval and what we've approved earlier in the meeting? Because it's slightly different and three of the councillors, myself included, on this committee are, are new to this process. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So the application before you is obviously an application for site plan control, which is very different than applications for a zoning bylaw amendment, draft plan of subdivision, draft plan of condo. So the, the zoning bylaw amendment through the Planning Act requires us to hold a public meeting, go through a full public process before we make a decision and before council approves anything. So that's a requirement of the Planning Act that council can't delegate to staff or, or say we, we don't want to do this process. It's a, a requirement and, and that's why we do it here. Um, with this type of application, it's under Section 41 of the Planning Act, so it's really the detailed design from a functional and uh, technical perspective. And under the Planning Act, it actually is, it, it's, it doesn't require any notice. The only person who has an appeal right on a site plan application is actually the owner. So the owner has the ability to appeal a non-decision within 30 days, or they have the owner, or they have the ability to appeal if they don't like the conditions that are being imposed by the municipality. Um, within the Planning Act, council is the approval authority. However, um, council has also passed a delegated authority bylaw, so bylaw 2006-74. Five, actually delegates all of the approval authority to the director of planning, um, except that it states that there's a procedure where you can refer the approval back to planning committee. So there's a, a number of steps that lay out the procedure in, the, in this bylaw of delegated authority. So um, in this instance, obviously, uh, the, this application was bumped up to planning committee uh, through a motion of council, and, and that's under this delegated authority bylaw. So that's why we come to you with our recommendation to refer it back to staff to deal with the final technical details and, and to approve the site plan. So there are no notice requirements with the approval of a site plan. And just to jump in very quickly on the end of that, thanks, Laura. Concluding to say that there's no notice requirement for site plate control applications. The city of Kingston goes above and beyond in that regard. 
in tonight's meeting was advertised in the exact same way that all the other meetings tonight that you've heard were advertised. So uh, 120 meter mail out to the surrounding neighbors of this property, the signage was posted on the property as well as a courtesy advertisement in the, in the Whig standard. So it's consistent across uh, all of which um, I believe District Councillor uh, Holland has uh, <clears throat> had a meeting with some of the neighborhood uh, and it's been brought to their attention. Um, but but in, in absence of that, I personally have not been made aware of any outstanding comments from members of the public or community in the processing of this site plan control application since we've concluded zoning bylaw amendment. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for the clarification. So we'll do questions first to council or committee rather, and then uh, next if Councillor Holland has any questions, and then to the public. So from the committee, Councillor Hutchins. Awesome. Thanks for the presentation. And um, Thank you. very good. Thank you. Um, the I just have a couple of questions. There's probably nothing can be done about it at this stage. But why doesn't the street run through to the road at, at the bar, at the south end? It just seems such a waste in so, terms of traffic flow and connecting this neighborhood to the rest of the Oh, city. yeah. Right here? Uh, Is it? Well, you can't, yes, right there, yeah. yeah. Well, it stopped there, but it runs through the division, right? I don't know if it stopped up or something, but it yes. seems like an obvious thing to do. Why isn't it being yeah, done? Yeah, I, uh, I know the applicant here, Sean, has had that conversation with our parks division. I've had it as well, but uh, I'll let Sean take the floor. Your question is, why is it a cul-de-sac? Is that correct? Well, the cul-de-sac is an extra... I hate those things, those uh, sort of yeah, things. So the, the, the quick and uh, it's a borrowed sort of thing from the suburbs. So, you know, it, it, why wouldn't you, I mean, a yeah. grid system, road system is the best system. Yeah. So why didn't we do it? So, and, and we're back to one of Jason's earlier comments with the topography issue of this. As you go westward in that cul-de-sac, right behind that, there's a set of pedestrian stairs that go up an elevation nine oh. meters to oh, Alfred Crescent. Um, I think the pedestrians would take offense to us <laughs> removing that. <laughs> and that's city-owned, so we can't touch that. It's, it's, oh, it's... Yeah. Okay. The, this connection okay. right now is actually in city ownership through from division. The portion in which Sean referring to is, is here is the stairwell. Where? Um, oh, yeah. This portion is functioning really as a driveway um, and there's easement access over the city owned land, not mm -hmm. a public highway, an mm -hmm. easement over that public land for the church which is directly south of this site and gets its access via that area. But that doesn't prevent <coughs> be used as a street, they'd still have access. That's right. So through this 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 plan, we see that as a as an improvement, um, really, that the, the easement will be um, essentially resolved uh, on the parcel when it comes to the city in terms of a true municipal street through the public highway. And be and when it's declared a public highway. I'm not sure I understood that. Is there a street going to join up with that? Um, easement area or not? There's going to be a street that connects from Division Street in, yep. Yep. and there's going to be a bulb, a cul-de-sac bulb, oh, right just a there. bulb, but it won't connect to the development. Yeah, that'll that'll be the access point into this development. Oh, it will happen like that. That's right. Okay, well, that was my concern, so oh. that's fine. Okay. And then on the other side, also there's park area to the yeah. west and north, right? Of the entrance point. So we're, f we're just, we're you can see it there. It's the capsule, half a capsule shaped right there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So, um, just a question I, the parkland is only 10% of the requirement, and uh, that's 100 houses. I'm kind of wondering why that was allowed. So the parkland 
Um, I don't know the numbers and exactly the percentages that are required per dwelling unit. We've been working with our parks group and we started off several years ago um, with a, an area on the southern, southeastern area, down in this area, that actually provided an, a larger space that was gonna be provided to the municipality in full, not in easement form. Um, however, the, the topography challenge again, uh, and the site's con constraints, not only from a topography area, but also from an area perspective from stormwater management, had us reconsider that. The, this area became the most viable, um, and as you pointed out, it's not sufficient in terms of a full dedication. So the applicant will be required to complete the market appraisal of the site after this zoning, the zoning's approved, but after this is designed to understand what the valuation will be and then provide the additional in, value, in, in, in monetary terms. I understood that, but yes, uh, it's, if I remember correctly, a vague memory of this, I've been there a number of times, is that the land is falling away fairly rapidly. And that meant you had to do all these adjustments, right? Okay. One last thing, the solid waste, yeah. the enclosures. Yeah. Why isn't this simply picked up by, the, by solid waste management in terms of regular uh, garbage pickup? <clears throat> Yeah, Sean's had lots of conversations with our director of solid waste. You had uh, conversations with, uh, with your director of solid waste and your supervisor at solid waste. And I'm new to this game, right? I had visions that I walk in and they have a solution for me. And I was shocked to find out there is nowhere in the city of Kingston that solid waste actually works well in multifamily. And you will hear that from every staff member there. So I said, well, let's try and make this the one that works. Um, so I've been to them several times, and, and so where we're at right now is we're focusing on recycling. So there's some enclosures for the commercial size recycling bins that are now in Jason's inbox. Um, but we are not going to do any storage of waste on site because universally the staff said it's a horrible idea, it doesn't work. And nowhere does it work in the city. So these spots, what we've actually done is there's a couple of on those islands beside the parking facing the road that goes all the way through. We've expanded into a couple of the parking spots to create a larger pickup spot. So yes, the municipality will be able to pick these up. Um, the truck will have to go through, turn around the cul-de-sac, go back the other direction because they can only pick up from the one side of the truck. So I've met with them and I hope we have a solution that's gonna be a model for the future. Okay, I've got a comment on that. <clears throat> Years I, I managed Kingston Cooperative Homes. It's stacked town housing. It's, some of it is two story, some of it is three story, like taller than these, right? It's picked up door to door. Always the garbage is being picked up that way. So it's quite possible. They don't like it. Councillor, can we do comments do after? It. Just sure. questions then? Okay. Thank you. I just want to suggest that it can be done, okay? And um, I believe yeah, under some situations it's actually cheaper. So, okay. Further questions from the that's committee? That's it. I've got it. That's, I'm done. Councillor Chappelle. Thank you through you, Chair. Um, it's an interesting concept. Uh, my question is, are these going to be for rent or uh, ownership? That ends up a financial decision day that the financiers will answer. <laughs> um, the demand is obviously there hugely for both. Um, if, it, if it's up to me, it's going to be rental probably. <laughs> Not up to me. <laughs> Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I did the comprehensive report, and it was just because of the trees, and I just wondered, now that it's in site plan, so we have 50 trees to be removed. Are they already removed, or when are they going to be removed? They've been removed in a quarter met that was issued in 2015 um, to, to make way for some of the cleaning and grubbing to, for the project uh, in accordance with our site alteration bylaws. So that's been completed. Um, that said, I didn't unfortunately bring the landscape plan with me tonight. The applicant 
is providing, and Sean will know it more off the top of his head better than I will, but the applicant is providing a substantial amount of new vegetation on the site. Um, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head for trees, but uh, it is something that uh, is very cog that we're very cognizant of, and our, our forestry staff have been a part of it through the review. Okay, so just following with that, then are there trees still left on the site, and are those trees going to be coming down? Yeah, there's absolutely trees left on the site. Uh, I believe there's some additional trees that will need to come down to make way for this this density uh, and this this parking configuration, et cetera. But there will be trees that you see today that will be retained through the process of this development. And that available on the landscape plan. If I go into Dash, That's right. I could actually see that. That's right. Okay. I can send that to you. And. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I guess that covered, oh, um, for the, so yeah, we have $18,000 in compensation. Do we know when those trees are gonna be planted? Like, are they gonna be planted in the, I know the city always does the fall plantings. So are we looking at 2019 or 2020? When do we think this is gonna be built so we can try to get the trees in the ground to, you know, the little saplings finally make up for the big established 50 trees that were removed? I honestly, it's the department, it's in the forestry department's hands with respect to when and where those tree, or those monies would be spent for tree compensation. And the permit was issued in 2015. I would not be surprised if it's already been utilized and, and replenished elsewhere in terms of plantings. But I, but I don't know with certainty. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, sorry. The, um, the notice that was sent, and I definitely appreciate the, the extra step, was it sent only to the um, property owners in the area or did it go as well to the church, to Our Lady of Fatima Church? I would have to check the, the public notice itself for the mail out list, but I'm very confident that the the church was picked up in the 120 meter buffer that would be off of the property extent. Thanks. This is, I, these are mostly, I think, questions for staff. Um, the traffic study that was done, uh, 2015 to 2021, that will, will that be out of date by the time we have Build out. Will there be a need for a new traffic study? And I'm also, of course, thinking of the development in the area of the new high school and how that might impact Division Street. Yeah, it's a great. Um, the, the traffic study, which I haven't reviewed in detail before tonight's meeting, um, should anticipate projected flows beyond 2021. Um, and I was also a part of the high school site plan control application, which conducted their own traffic study analysis um, in support of that site plan control application as well into the foreseeable future, longer than two years. Um, but it would have been required to contemplate a build out of this site based on its zoning permissions to allow that density already. Um, so I would say uh, I, I can revisit the traffic study and get you a better answer via email um, than what I'm going to be able to provide you right now, but um, it, it should be considered and looked at um, from both angles in longer term than 2021. And Laura can assist additional info. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, when we're reviewing the application for a zoning bylaw amendment, we obviously require the traffic study to be completed. Um, right now, within the jurisdiction of the Planning Act, we don't have the ability to do a conditional approval that requires the construction of units within X number of dates of a, the approval of that zoning bylaw amendment. So as soon as we approve this 
application through that zoning bylaw amendment. Um, the principle of the development is already established and it's not something that we are able to revisit through the site plan process saying, um, is the, are these number of units appropriate from a transportation perspective? Because that was already established at the time of the zoning bylaw. So it, it's not within our jurisdiction to require that transportation study again because it was already completed to the satisfaction at the time that it was approved, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, the And then the status of Frey Street, so I, I I'm just gonna give my my understanding. So it is, it would in order to get the frontage that's required um, for the north the southern portion, Frey Street would need to be completed. But the uh, the approval of this is sort of the next is an important step prior to the completion of Frey Street because the proponent would be required to do that construction. And so knowing that, that this, this site plan control application will be going ahead is important in order to move ahead on the construction of the street. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, it's really a timing game. Yeah. Um, the applicant has been provided the agreement for execution because the city, for, for Frey Street, because if that wanted to be constructed today, we have all the technical detail and the security detail associated with that. Okay. Um, it's just, I think, the reluctance, I'll say, mm -hmm. of the applicant in that their um, confirmation that they can proceed with everything else before spending the expenditures. Yeah. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, the other big issue is what you don't see is all the servicing for that site goes underneath Frey Street, so we, we can't build it until we know <laughs> we have the site plan agreement that says here's the servicing you required. So it, it's a chicken and egg principle that we had to meet a few times over to figure out how to, how to deal with. And I, if I may also add, I should have included this in the presentation, but the whole rationale for the division of the land into two lots is because of the grade change with servicing. So Utilities Kingston restricts services to one service per parcel and to run the service off Barbara Avenue to the southern extent of this parcel, the topography doesn't make it viable. So then compounding the, the challenges of subdividing the parcel, but you need frontage, so constructing a street and then the timing associated with that. Um, okay, thanks. Finally, the uh, will there be another opportunity prior to the um, prior to entering into site plan control to, into the agreement for further public comment? I realize there there were none um, up until now, but things like the final situation with the garbage pickup and all of that, when that has been confirmed, is is there still an opportunity between now and then? whenever that is, to, to con collect that information from the public? There's always the opportunity to provide comment directly to myself as man the project manager, planning manager for this project. That said, there is not a scheduled meeting in public form between now and the foreseeable execution of an agreement. Are there any questions from the public? Mr. Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I could pause you for one second, just noting the time, uh, pursuant to our bylaw, uh, I need to ask for a motion to extend the meeting. Councillor Sanic moved until the end of the meeting. Thank you. Second by Councillor Hill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sands, for the presentation and the answers, and thanks to Council for getting at some very important issues. Um, I've been following this file since it first came to this committee in its current incarnation. I know there are previous projects have been tried on the site. So I'm going to reemphasize some of the points I made before because I don't think they've been adequately addressed with what I've seen so far. Uh, okay, so first of all, with Frey Street, it's going to have access to Division Street and then is it going to be signalized? That's, that's question one. Again, with Frey Street, is its creation holding up, 
possible construction on other aspects of the project? Or could they potentially go ahead without Free Street being approved and constructed? Still a little bit unclear on that. Okay. Uh, I guess my other point, which I really want to emphasize and have the committee try to get a sense of what's going to be going on there is <coughs> I've walked by the site a number of times and as Mr. Sands explained, it's not only slopey from north to south, it's very slopey from west to east. So that's a couple of things. It's creating enormous practical difficulties in terms of constructing on the site. And I want to emphasize the safety, not only for the workers who will be doing the work if this gets approved, but for people who live on Division Street. Right? They're having construction right in behind their houses on a hill that's very steep. So I would like to see more detail in something what I would call a seasonal construction plan with two aspects there. Number one, stay away from winter if you can for construction. And number two, stay away from areas with times when it's been stormy. Because the ground's going to be slippery and you're going to have issues with your equipment being able to stay in place and safe. So I'm really concerned about that. And um, my dad, or my late father, was an engineer. He constructed and designed buildings. I grew up around that. Um, tech person myself. And we really have to be aware just how tough this is. This might be as tough as we've seen in Kingston. And that's why it's been left alone for construction. Then my final point is, I just believe the density is too high for this site. And I'd be easier to agree if the density was lower, and then that's tied in with the actual, to actual site aspects being so tough. So, thank you. One, uh, just one, one more 30, point briefly. 30 seconds. Um, yep. Looking at the express transit that's nearby, okay, on division, you've got the 701, 702 routes. I would advocate adding a new stop at the corner of division and railway street to be able to service the increased density. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We need a mover and seconder if there are no further questions or comments from the committee. Do you want me to address? Oh, my apologies, yeah. Please respond. I can try. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mr. Dixon. To your first comment, um, as it relates to signalization at the intersection of Frey Street and Division Street, that is not something that is going to be included. Uh, it was identified and explored through the traffic um, reporting that uh, Councillor Holland has alluded to through, this, through the zoning bylaw amendment process and determined that the volumes and uh, the intersection demands would not necessitate signalization. Um, the second question as it relates to Frey Street and the construction of Frey Street impeding additional development on site. Um, it's a tricky question to answer because you could say yes or you could say no. Um, there's a holding symbol on that entire southern portion of the property that's strictly tied to the construction of Frey Street. So the applicant has not, does not have the ability to pull a building permit for any construction on that portion of the site until Frey is successfully constructed and conveyed to the municipality. That said, there is a portion of the property that has frontage onto Barbara Avenue, which was considered the severed parcel and it contains 16 dwelling units which technically could be constructed in advance of Frey Street because its servicing and functionality would be directly via Barbara Avenue. That said, there would have to be a phased approach to a site plan control agreement to allow that to proceed in advance of the rest. Um, so it, it's, it, it's somewhere in the middle. <laughs> the sloping from the west to the east, the third question, um, you sound very familiar with the site. Uh, it, it truly does. And I think uh, that is something that uh, Mr. Marshall and his crews will need to 
explore uh, and be cognizant of in terms of safety as well as uh, for his workers and the, uh, the others. It uh, is something that's monitored through our building department of actual on-site building practices more so than a site plan control concern uh, in the approval state. Question number four with respect to the density. Um, that was a very uh, contentious, I'll call it, component to the zoning bylaw amendment process. Uh, 116 townhomes on a 4.5 acre property approximately equates to um, around 70 units per net hectare, which is medium density in our official plan. It does fall short of the high density. Um, I'm not gonna recite all of our compatibility tests and appropriatenesses of our OP. That was done through the zoning bylaw process and evaluated on the merits of the density at the time um, and believed to be appropriate from both a planning staff and a council perspective. Um, the fifth and final comment related to an express transit stop is duly noted and I can pass that along to our transportation division for consideration moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. So a mover and a seconder for the recommendation. Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Hutchinson. So I'll read the recommendation that the application for site plan control submitted by Jocelyn Engineering Incorporated on behalf of MC Townhomes Incorporated with respect to 70 Barber Avenue, requesting approval for the construction of 116 residential dwelling units be approved in principle and that the application be referred back to staff and that the Director of Planning, Building and Lic Licensing Services be authorized to issue final appro subject approval. Two, one, all outstanding technical issues being resolved to the satis satisfaction of the city. Two, the owner entering into a site plan control agreement with the city which shall list the approved plans and any special municipal conditions pertaining to the development. And three, the owner submitting the required financial security. All those in favor? All those opposed? <coughs> Excuse me, approved. So, seeing no new motions, are there any notices of motion? Seeing none, no other business, correspondence. The next meeting is March 7th at 6.30 here. Motion to adjourn, Councillor Hill, second by Councillor Osanigan. Thank you.